Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Muslim discussion group for inviting me. It was a great stay here in Lafayette, or West Lafayette, these last two days. I'll be leaving tomorrow morning, hopefully, God willing, unless I die in the meantime or something. So uh, I'll, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, for your questions last night. Uh, last night, like I said, I spoke about, it was really the central uh, thing I wanted to speak about, which was that I was an atheist from the time I was 16 to the time I was 28. I had certain questions that burned inside me, uh, certain issues that I could not reconcile with belief in God, um, issues like why does God allow suffering in the earth? Why doesn't he just pop us into heaven from the start? Why did he make us sinful and rebellious? Why did he not just make, create us like angels and put us into heaven so we could be with him and he could love us, all of us, instead of a fraction of us? You know, um, those, why would he give us reason if our reason very often and ultimately leads us to uh, not have faith, sometimes conflict with faith? Why does he give us the ability to choose evil if he doesn't want us to commit evil? Uh, why would a perfect God create such an imperfect world and put such an imperfect creature in it where it could work out his most imperfect inclinations? You know, these are some of the issues and the questions. And I had others as well. And, uh, and when I read, read the Quran from cover to cover, by the time I was finished, I had no questions left. I got to the point where one by one, all these bricks, this edifice I had built that separated me from belief in God, that entire edifice fell one by one, brick by brick. And I saw that my, the Quran essentially showed me that the questions I raised were, in the sense, not legitimate. And that's what I talked about last night. It showed me that it presented an entirely different view of the purpose of life. It eradicated those questions I had. I'm not going to say that that proved to me that there was a God, but at least it left me with no argument against the existence of God. It was quite a jump from one to the other. It's one thing not to have an argument anymore against his existence. It's another thing to come to faith. But at least I tried to talk about that last night, how the Quran argued against my argument against the belief in God. I, I can't repeat that tonight. It will take two more hours, so I will not do that. But I would talk about other thing, aspects of the Quran that also caught my attention. I mean, somewhere along the line, if you're going to give up a belief system, and for me, atheism was a belief system. It was, for me, a faith. Because no one, you know, I mean, I wasn't sure there was not a God, but I believed that the idea of God was an impossibility, led to rational contradictions. But it was, for me, a faith. And if you're going to unseat a person's faith, you have to get that person to doubt. Because once that doubt, door of doubt is opened, and slowly but surely, it eats away at a person's faith like a cancer and strips it away. And very often, then, that person is open to change. And oftentimes, when we think of doubt, we think of doubt against belief in God. And we watch that happen with people. But in my case, just the reverse happened. The door of doubt was opened. And tonight, I would like to talk about other things that caused me, aspects of the Quran that led me to question my atheism, that sort of opened that door of doubt. These issues are not as central as the ones I talked about yesterday, so they're not as maybe compelling, not as maybe powerful. But I wanted to discuss them nonetheless because I don't see them very much discussed by Muslim writers or non-Muslim writers. Does anyone have a watch I could borrow? Oh, well, there's this here. <laughs> I could just keep turning around and looking at this. Sorry, don't need it. Uh, <clears throat> So I'll try to do this in not too long tonight. Let's see, it's 10 of 8. I promise not to go certainly beyond an hour. Now I'll answer your questions and let you leave early, So, because you looked really exhausted after last night. And you looked like you could really use some Gatorade. OK. <clears throat> well, first thing I noticed, one of the first things I noticed when I read the Quran, so when I picked up the Quran, I was expecting to read a scripture. Of course, in my mind, a scripture was essentially a history of a people 
or a biography of a person. And that's what I was expecting to uh, read when I opened the Quran. And lo and behold, to my amazement, oops, excuse me, it was, it was neither. It was not a history, and it was not a biography of a person. And it, it was presented as a direct revelation from God to the reader, and it addresses the re really reader personally. And it's clear that the author intends for you to th believe that that's God addressing it. Whether you accept that or not, you know, Muslims certainly accept it, others may not. <clears throat> but that is definitely the perspective of the Quran. And the Quran, in its revelation, weaves together different aspects of life. It presents the stories of humanity, it presents instruction, or what you would like to say, law. It presents uh, arguments from natural phenomenon for the existence of God. It uh, presents arguments from human nature. It presents arguments from reason and from logic, and maybe those dominate the Quran. But it weaves together all the various aspects of life, weaves them together to point to a single, what the Quran considers, supreme fact that your Lord, your God, is one. It doesn't separate these things I mentioned into separate chapters. Just as these things are interwoven throughout our lives, they are interwoven throughout the Quran. So the Quran was definitely not a history, but it does report stories, stories about humanity, narratives, parables about human beings and human nature. And you know, I, I would like to talk about that for a little bit, because for me that created something of a curiosity. Though the Quran contains stories, most of the stories in it are about prophets of old or holy, per or you know, pious persons of old. Or sometimes it even involves people who led bad lives and ultimately went to their self-destruction. Although it contains these stories, an interesting aspect about it is that it contains no chronology, no dates, no historical landmarks, nothing like that. And you have to realize that when I was reading the Quran, I was keeping my eye open for such types of things. I was looking for anachronisms. I was expecting that there would be some sort of historical contradictions. You know, because ultimately, you know, I mean, you find those in every scripture. Not that I would think, meant, would, thought it would mean very much. I was mostly interested in the purpose of life. I wasn't going to discard the scripture for that reason. And plus, my way of thinking about revelation was not really at that time a sort of Muslim way of thinking about it, where you Muslims believe that God is speaking through the Quran directly through, through Muhammad, the prophet, to humanity, a direct address. So that wouldn't have really discouraged me, but I kept my eye open for, uh, nonetheless, just out of curiosity. And as I went through the Quran, I could find, first of all, nothing that would contradict history or, what, or uh, a historical, that would be subject, I would say, to historical criticism. Because as I said, it has no historical reference points. It's not anchored in history. It has many stories in the Quran. Sometimes they begin in one surah, picks parts of it will be picked up in another surah. Parts, is it hot in here tonight? It feels hot to me. Part of it will be picked up later on. But still, you know, so it has some, a few continuous narratives, but many of these are not, not. But regardless of that fact, it's impossible to place these accounts in the Quran in history without consulting outside sources. So it gives the stories sort of a transcendent feel. Like it's easy to place yourself in the position of the characters in the stories because all the historical reference points, all the superficial details are stripped away and the stories are told in such a way they just get to the moral or spiritual point. <clears throat> the interesting thing about it though is that if you look at the Quran, it's very often not clear if a story that's being told is being presented as history, whether it's be being presented as a parable, a symbolic story, whether it's being pre presented as a very popular legend which the Quran is recasting to teach the Arabs who, for them, these legends were everything that they used to recite at their annual trade fairs, whether it's recasting them to bring out a, a moral point, because it's certainly referring to stories that they are well, that they know well. It's not 
And sometimes it's not clear whether even when it's telling a story, it's a merger of these. The author seems purposely ambiguous on the point. And last night I told you we got into a discussion about the story of Adam. Is that relating to histor the historical origins of Homo sapiens? Or is it an allegory? And some Quranic scholars thought it was an allegory. Others thought it was ancient scholars, thought it was history. But the point is, is that and there are internal details that lead you to believe one or the other. But for me at least, it wasn't clear. And the same could be said for so many of the accounts in the Quran. The story of Luqman, for example. You know, again, you know, it was difficult, not Luqman, Dhul Karnain, the prophet conqueror who conquered from, from the west to the far, to the very east of the, this planet. Journeyed west to the farthest point, east to the farthest point, the prophet conqueror. The Muslims have never been able to really identify him with any historical personality. Some identified him with Alexander the Great, but we all know Alexander the Great was a polytheist. It's a historical fact, and Dhul Karnain is presented as a strict monotheist. So the point was, was the Quran recasting a famous legend that the people understood to teach them a moral, ethical point and spiritual point, make spiritual, teach them moral, spiritual, spiritual lessons, or was it history? I don't, I'm not arguing with anybody how you relate to this. I'm just saying for me, it was not clear. And it seemed to me that the author was being purposely ambiguous at, this, at that point. By not including explicit temporal references, it seemed that he was not trying to, it seemed like he was avoiding, contradicting the beliefs, the assumptions of his initial audience for whom history, legend, poem, etc. were interwoven and merged, and at the same time avoiding conflicting with the reason and thinking of a people of a much later time who very, were very critical about such distinctions. Whatever the case may be, how much, as much as I wanted to find some way to historically criticize the Quran, from a rational standpoint, I could find no rational justification. There just wasn't enough there to criticize it from a historical standpoint. And that intrigued me because I thought, why? If, pro if this man was the author, the man whom I assumed it was, Muhammad, why would he omit historical reference points purposely because it's done throughout the entire Quran? Why would he omit them? Certainly when the Arabs told these stories, and it was clear from the Quran that they were familiar with many of them, at least it's somewhat, they, told, they had such historical reference points. Certainly they wouldn't have minded if they were included. They didn't have it in their mentality at that point to resort to historical criticism. Why would he avoid that? Why would he avoid it throughout the Quran? It started to open up a question for me. This author almost seemed to have an eye to the future when he wrote the Quran, when he, uh, whom I assumed was Muhammad, and I thought as he wrote the Quran. It was just a question. Also, I looked towards the sort of references to nature, natural phenomenon in the Quran, keeping an eye open there for inconsistencies, false, erroneous notions. Because you know, back in the seventh century, <laughs> there were many false, erroneous notions about how nature works. <clears throat> and, excuse me, <clears throat> there were many such false, erroneous notions. And I would assume that they would be in the scripture some of them. Because if you look at the ancient scriptures of other peoples, you'll inevitably find some. I'm not putting them down. I'm not making any judgment about other scriptures. It was just something I expected to see. But when I read the Quran and read what it had to say about the nature and its workings and natural phenomenon, I could find no erroneous notions that conflicted with what we now know, what modern science has taught us. And so oftentimes, as I read through that, I would discover verses that referred to natural phenomenon that had a certain intriguing style about it. You know, for example, you, there's a verse that goes, have the unbelievers, have not the unbelievers seen that the heavens and the earth were at one time one, and we exploded them apart. 
and that every living thing is made from water. And when I read that verse, I said, you know, what is the author referring to here? I mean, this is a guy in the seventh century. That is a peculiar statement to make that long ago. Have not the unbelievers seen? Have not the unbelievers seen? Why does he say the unbelievers? Why does he say the believers? Have not the unbelievers seen that the heavens and the earth were at one time one, and we exploded them apart, and that every living creature is made from water? I mean, is he referring to the fact that most human beings, every living cell is at least 70% water? I, mean, I, I had no idea what he was referring to, but it was an intriguing statement. The heavens and the earth were at one times one, and it was exploding apart, making allusion to what? The Big Bang? Impossible, of course, I thought, impossible. But still, it was an extremely intriguing reference. And he talks in the Quran how the earth and the sun, the sun and the moon, each swim through their courses in a circle, in a circular motion. What? I mean, who in the seventh century believed the sun traveled in a circle or the earth traveled in a circle? It was a strange statement to make, I thought, way back then. And there were many such statements. It says in the Quran, in the heavens and the earth. No, it says, in the heavens, we are expanding it. In the heavens, we are expanding it? What do you mean you're stretching the heavens? You're expanding the heavens? Of course, today we know about the expansion of the universe, and I wasn't assuming that that's what it was saying. But there were just statements in the Quran that had a sort of uncanny resemblance to things that we've come to know or believe in. I wasn't insisting to myself, I'm, I wasn't a Muslim at the time, <laughs> not insisting to myself that that was it, what it was referring to. But it definitely piqued my curiosity. But more importantly, as I read through the Quran, I couldn't find any such, histor any such reference to natural phenomena that conflicted with what we now believe, scientifically. Once again, though, I mean, the statements, they're not explicit enough to fully elaborate a scientific theory. So even though it's the initial audience of the Quran may have turned their head at it and thought, what does this verse mean? Still, it wasn't something that conflicted with what they believed. But at the same time, for a person living in the 20th century, he reads that, it doesn't conflict with what he believes either, and it piques his interest. It seemed that the so-called signs from nature in the Quran kind of fulfilled a role similar to what the stories did for the ancient audience. It drew their attention captured their imagination, piqued their interest, without violating anything they held sacred, that they were firmly convinced of. In the same way, these, these references to nature did the same for us, or did the same for me, I should say, and without conflicting what I firmly believe. So I thought, I mean, this author is something of a genius. Because I tried to imagine how he did this. I mean, how did he go about doing this? I mean, he was so clever, I thought, that when he related historical references, he must have thought that there could be potential conflicts when he related them with what people would later find out. So therefore, he removed all historical reference points. But on the other hand, when he does relate these historical references, reference points, he does provide certain kinds of details that are that, that he uses them in such a way that he's making very profound and powerful moral and spiritual points. Now, how did he do, do with these science things? I don't know. He started making these certain scientific statements that would definitely pique people's notions, but somehow he was able to do it in such a delicate and intricate and ambiguous way so that he was able to do it in such a way that it would pique people's interests without conflicting with anybody's scientific knowledge. I thought, this author is a genius beyond any I could ever possibly imagine. Because not only that, I mean, he wrote a scripture that is so powerful that it forces you almost, or it forced me, to engage in conversation with it. Its literary power was tremendous. I mean, when I read the, the stories in the Quran, I mean, they're, they're powerful, they're beautiful, they move with rapid pace. 
It's like watching one of those, ex uh, an exciting, an exciting, because I often don't find these exciting, television soap operas, except in verbal form. Because you know when you watch these television soap operas at night, suddenly you see a scene, and a conversation begins here, and then they shift immediately to another scene that sort of relates this scene to that scene with, a, with no break in continuity of thought. When I read through the Quran, you know, the stories were just so powerful. The literature, the economy of expression was so great. I'll just give you a quick example. When I read the story of Yusuf, for example, you read that story, it's, well, you shift from one scene to the other without breaking the continuity of thought, and verse by verse by verse, you're going from one scene to another. So here you have Yusuf talking to his cellmates. The next verse, one of the cellmates is carrying the conversation to the ruler. The next verse, the ruler tells the cellmate, tells this guy to go find this man who gave you this information. Then in the very next scene, you're in prison, and he's talking to him. And all along, each verse by verse is carrying on a conversation that's perfectly continuous, even though the scene is shifting from one place to the next, to the next, to the next. So verbally, you have this transition of place going on in your mind. And just like in modern television, it captures your imagination. Because of the scene shifts. You notice nowadays, they, in television, they sh talk about four seconds about this scene and then four seconds about this scene. They don't let any scene last too long because they know people's minds wander. They look too long at the same scene. Brilliant literary style. <clears throat> I thought this author was ex extremely brilliant in his style in the way he used the natural signs, in the way he told these stories, in the way he was able to present all this without conflicting, without opening himself up to historical or scientific criticism. I thought it was amazing. <clears throat> I thought he was brilliant. I thought he must have known human psychology very well and human nature, the way he was able to lure you into conversation with the Quran. <clears throat> Many of those signs in the Quran mystified Muslim commentators in the first few centuries. You know, those signs from nature. When they wrote about them, they would come up with the most crazy theories about what the verse was referring to. Because their knowledge was limited at that time, and they had no idea what it was referring to. There's a verse in the Quran that talks about how God has planted mountains on the earth so it doesn't shake with you too much. One Muslim scholar wrote, famous Muslim scholar, wrote that that's because the earth sits on top of a huge body of water and there's a gigantic whale underneath that is supporting the earth. And when the whale shifts, the earth shakes. So the mountains sort of prevent the whale from shaking. I mean, this was, to him, science. That shows you how far people back then were from even getting a grasp on some of these signs. How, er how erroneous were some of their notions back in those days. So you would suspect when you read the scripture, you would see some of that filtering into the scripture, but it did not. And I thought that was amazing. I thought the man definitely transcended, because I thought the author was a man, definitely transcended his time and place. <clears throat> I mentioned yesterday that the Quran states explicitly many times that it uses symbolism to make its point, that there are verses that are plain and that there are verses that are symbolic. Especially when you come upon references, I mean, this happened to me a few times, I'd come upon a reference referring to the day of judgment or the hereafter or heaven and hell that seemed too concrete, too suited to the mentality of the people at that time. And I gave some examples of it yesterday. And right after I came upon the first such reference, the Quran would say, and God does not, is not shy of using any parable, even that of a gnat. It's not, it's not shy from using symbolism. Just when I found a reference that sort of conflicted with my reason, when I talked about the hereafter, in the very next verse, before I dismiss this Quran, the next verse says, but God does not shy away from using symbolism. And that type of thing would happen several times as I read through the Quran. <clears throat> Essentially, I could not really find anything in a Quran that could definitely, definitively conflict with the way I thought. And then I would come upon a verse in a Quran that would say something like this. 
Have they not reflected on this Quran? Surely if it is from other than God, they would find in it many a contradiction. Have they not reflected on this Quran? Surely if it was other, from other than God, they would find in it many a contradiction. Here I am reading through the Quran, keeping my eye open for such contradictions, and I come across something like that. It would seem time and time again like the author was reading my mind, understanding what I was going through, and just sort of pointing me and responding to my thinking. <clears throat> well, I can't review for you my entire experience of reading the Quran, but I'll just very quickly try to summarize my reactions to some of these things. I mean, when I first started reading the Quran, I very early got intrigued with who the author was. And I thought I'd better study about this man, Muhammad, who the Western translator said was the author of the Quran. The translator was a non-Muslim. <clears throat> and from what I read from Western uh, Orientalists, Western writers of the Quran, and they noted a curious thing, that the Arabian Pen Peninsula during the time of the Prophet was no cradle of learning or philosophy. It was one of the most backward areas of the world. It was a Bedouin tribal society. And if you read the Quran, it's very clear that it was very much a primitive tribal society. Just read the way the Quran talks to the Bedouin, the, the, its audience, the type of issues it responds to, the mentality that it deals with. It's very clear that the initial audience is quite primitive. Women used to walk around with their chests exposed. Uh, they killed their children. They committed female infanticide. Uh, sexual promiscuity, licentiousness was everywhere. Marriage was meant practically nothing. Husbands would leave their premises, their wives would bring in other men because they were afraid that in those dangerous times that their husbands could be dead would never come back alive. And so they sought protection in the arms of another man. Um, the tribes, Arabia knew no government. They were torn into, into ribbons by internal tribal strife. They were just a very primitive, backward society. They had no, they had no uh, great works of literature. No works of literature, they left no liter literary uh, nothing from, they left no literature behind, the ancient Arabs did before Islam. No great works of literature, no great works of literature, period. No great architecture, no great art, no music, nothing. They left no trace of what we call civilization. They knew no Greek mathematics, no science, had no great odes, you know, that hand down to posterity. To this day, nothing before that era has survived. It was a barren, as far, culturally, it was a barren wasteland. Like a lot of primitive tribal peoples, like a lot of prim primitive tribal peoples that even have existed up in, almost up until recent times, you know, they just had no great history, no great historical, cultural refinement or development. They're an extremely primitive people. All the scholars would agree upon, everybody who has studied that civilization agrees on at least that much. And it's easy because they left nothing behind. It's impossible to cover up completely historical and cultural development if it did take place but they left no signs of that behind them. And it's not recorded. Their only art form was poetry, handed down orally. From one, you know, hand, handed down and spoken orally. They didn't even record it in writing. But that was their favorite art form and their major entertainment. <clears throat> well, the reason why I mention all that is because when you look at the Quran, it is, no matter how, what you think, no matter how you read it, it's a very sophisticated work. It's a very sophisticated scripture. In a lot of ways I just mentioned, and I tried to convey at least the things about it that impressed me. But if you look at all the great scriptures of the world that have come to us, you'll notice that they've all come to us 
through highly developed cultures. They emerge from highly developed cultures, the Hellenistic culture in the case of the New Testament. Uh, the Hindu scriptures came out of the great Hindu civilization, which was highly refined and highly developed in its time. The Chinese scriptures came out of the great Chinese civilizations. Civilizations that showed strong and powerful uh, cultural development and refinement that took place over many, many years. But when you look at this scripture, this emerged from the, one of the most primitive tribal peoples in the history of mankind. It came out of a cultural, civilizational desert. And that to me just seemed extremely strange. How can something so beautiful, so powerful in its logic, so powerful in its, its having such literary power, being so profound in its philosophy and its thinking, so advanced in its thinking, how could such something so powerful, so advanced, so ingenious come out of these primitive confines of the Arabian Peninsula? To me, that such a work should emerge from such an environment, to me, was like finding a rose bush in the most desolate area of the empty quarter of the Arabian Peninsula, just suddenly blooming out of nowhere. <clears throat> it caused me to wonder, how can, what kind of author was this that wrote the Quran? <clears throat> I found the Quran's stress on reason radical. To this day, I don't know of any other religion that puts so much stress on reason. I don't know of any religious scholars in, in any other religion that insist that reason and faith work hand in hand and that reason is essential to faith. To me, that seemed like a radical notion. The author of the Quran was way ahead of his time. It was clear that the author, if it was Muhammad, he had no at least according to the Western scholars of it, he had no formal education. No formal education. Then how could this man transcend his time and place so greatly? I mean, if you look at other great geniuses like Einstein and his development of the theory of relativity, his development of the theory of relativity was preceded by centuries and centuries of scientific advancement. The whole science of physics was moving in that direction. If Einstein hadn't found that theory, somebody else would have soon after. You have Andre Weil's great proof of Fermat's last theorem, another ingenious effort. But it was preceded by centuries and centuries of development in mathematics and work on that specific problem. You really can't say that his effort was a singular effort. And Shakespeare and Van Gogh and Mozart, they were truly great, but they did not transcend their time so phenomenally, their environment so phenomenally. Yeah. There were other great, great musicians, other great writers, other great painters that, that helped to develop an atmosphere where, the, where you would, could expect such a production. But you have to remember that you know, the Quran, it was like it came out of the Amazon, one of the most trim, primitive tribes in the Amazon. The Arabs are not a sophisticated people. <clears throat> On the other hand, not only did I think that if Muhammad were the author of the Quran, he would have to have been one of the greatest geniuses, maybe the greatest genius in the history of the humanity, but I realized also that if Muhammad were the author of the Quran, then he was an extremely devout and al altruistic person. Because the Quran does nothing else but invite people to the worship of one God and to live a good life, a just life, a caring life a merciful life. <clears throat> it instructs the readers of the Quran to be devout to God and to, be, and to work incessantly for the betterment of their fellow man. So the message that he preached was, in, was purely monotheistic and purely humanitarian. And it showed a deep caring for his fellow, for fellow man and it showed a deep devotion to God. Also, I thought if Muhammad were the author of the Quran, then he was extremely, extremely humble. Because when you read the Quran, he, 
He completely almost effaces himself from the scripture. He says the Quran calls, says about the, the prophet that he is only a man, that he has no supernatural powers, that his only task is to deliver the, script, to deliver the message, to only be a warner. Not only that, the Quran even criticizes him, sometimes severely in, place, in places. Points out errors he's making, errors in judgment. Points out, criticizes him in very severe terms. Like, uh, let me just give you a quick example here. One of my favorites, if I could find it. Okay. Yes, here it goes. It said, this is a surah that was revealed, just to set it up for you. The prophet, peace be upon him, apparently was talking to two Meccan chiefs, powerful men in the Meccan society at that time. And a blind man approached him and wanted to ask him about the revelation or a piece of the scripture that he had revealed, a part of the scripture he had revealed. But he was so intent on talking to these two individuals that he frowned and tried to ignore the blind man that approached him. And uh, this verse in the Quran responds, this passage in the Quran responds to that. It says, he frowned and turned away because the blind man approached him. And what would inform you but that, the blind, that he, the blind man, might grow in faith or take heed and so might, excuse me, take heed of the reminder and it might help him. As for him who thinks himself independent, unto him you give your full attention. Yet it is not a concern of you if that person grows. But as for him who comes unto you with an earnest heart and has God consciousness, from him you are distracted. But no, this is surely an admonishment for all mankind. So let so whosoever will pay heed to it. Criticizes him very severely. And there are several of such instances in the Quran. He must have been totally humble and self-effacing. Not only that, as I read through the Quran, I find verses that in the early stages, where the Quran is coming to support a man who is apparently wondering about this revelational experience he's having and wondering if he's losing his mind. Because several times the Quran says to him things like, you are not by the grace of your Lord mad or possessed. You are clearly on a straight path. In another verse, it tells him that you are not losing your mind. In another verse, it says, by the glorious morning light, light and the night by, when it is still in dark, your guardian Lord has not forsaken you, nor is he displeased. And soon he will grant you, and you will be well pleased. And so forth and so on. It was recited when the, you know, when the gentleman began the Quran today. I mean, here we see the Quran telling him in places, encouraging him in its very early stages, when it's first being revealed to him, telling him, no, you're not mad. You're not going crazy here. This is no less than a revelation from on high. And then you are on a straight way. And it seemed to me that if I was going to forge a scripture, that's the last type of thing I would put in it. <laughs> I mean, what kind of personality would do this? You know, suddenly include verses where the Quran is coming to him and t assuring him that he is not losing his mind. I mean, if I was going to forge a scripture, I would make it seem like I'm perfectly confident about this message that I'm receiving. But this would be, a, but if I was sincere, this is what I would expect. If I was having this powerful revelational experience, something like I never had ever known before in my life, I'd probably think I was losing my mind when I first had it. In any case, it did seem to show a tremendous sincerity, a love of God, and a tremendous compassion for humanity. <clears throat> and like I said, on the other hand, he says he's only a man. He's here to deliver the message. He has no supernatural powers, the Quran says. He, like everyone else, must pray for guidance and forgiveness. Criticizes it, cor it corrects him. But on the one hand, he seemed like an utter, a man who must be utterly sincere and extremely devoted to, get, to God. But on the other hand, I could not ignore the fact that if he were the author to, of the Quran, at the same time, he had to be the greatest liar in history. 
because he concocted the most audacious hoax ever because he claimed that he was receiving direct revelation from God. And so the two pictures just didn't match. And on one hand, we have this man who is, seems utterly sincere, inviting people to nothing else but goodness, inviting people to nothing else but the worship of one God, and, on, and he's doing it in an ingenious way with a powerful uh, scripture that tr certainly transcends his environment. He's doing all this, and on the other hand, the whole thing is a lie. This is why Thomas Carlyle, the famous Orientalist in the beginning of the century, said that, gave that revolutionary speech where he said, if you read the Quran, you're left to, he was an Orientalist, he said, if you read the Quran, one thing you have to conclude is that Muhammad was utterly sincere in believing that these revelations were from none other than God. <clears throat> And that was just something I had a difficult time dealing with. I thought maybe that the author had multiple personalities. You know, maybe on the one hand, he thought God was speaking to him, but on the other hand, you know, he, he wasn't. So at one time, he, he assumed the God personality, and it was criticizing him or assuring him, and at other times, he would assume. But clearly, the Quran is not the work of a fragmented personality. So it was too ingenious, too profound, too coherent, too rational. No, couldn't have been that. <clears throat> In the same way, I thought it couldn't be the work of several individuals, and I toyed with that concept for a while. Because if the Quran was a work of several individuals, you would see several different viewpoints in the text. It's not hard to do. And you can see that in most scriptures you look at. But the personality behind the Quran was definitely one. Towards the end of my reading of the Quran, I fell on the subject of, not the subject of, but a book of hadith, sayings of the Prophet outside of what is revealed in the Quran, the personal recollections of his followers of sayings and teachings he made. And when I read the hadith, his reported sayings, apart from the Quran, when I read them, the two personalities you see in the hadith literature and the personality behind the Quran are clearly and indisputably distinct. I defy any of you to get out the Hadith literature and go through it and read the thousands of sayings that have been attributed to the Prophet and compare it to the personality in the Quran and there is just no comparison. There are definitely two distinct personalities. Or at least it seemed that way to me. <clears throat> so. If the Prophet were the author of the Quran, I assumed that he was the greatest human anomaly, or the true author somehow entirely escaped the view of history. <clears throat> so in any case, so I had gotten through the Quran, I got gotten to the stage where I had all these rational objections to belief in God, and I spoke about these last night. And by the time I was done reading it, I no longer had them. I had this dilemma of trying to figure out how this author of the Quran faced this picture, fit this picture. I had a hard time doing that. And I was all done fit, uh, reading the Quran, had these questions about authorship, and I went over to my friend Mahmoud Kandil's house one night, and I had, uh, he invited me over for dinner. And his sister let me in, and, I, and she told me to sit on the couch while, while Mahmoud came out, because he was in the shower. <clears throat> And while I was sitting there, I was listening to a tape. And Mahmoud had a tape on the uh, stereo. And Mahmoud, he used to love music. Rock and roll, jazz, rhythm and blues, classical. He was a great music lover. But tonight on the tape, <clears throat> he had a tape of this music that was coming out of the Quran that had no musical accompaniment, no instrumental accompaniment. It was just a single voice. And it was, to me, it sounded like it was singing. And it was singing in the most strangest and most, in a, in a very strange and haunting way. <clears throat> and it had a very strong and powerful cadence and rhyme. And it had a definite musical quality or rhythm to it, a natural inborn rhythm. And I was listening to it again and again and again, and I noticed that it would suddenly shift from one very strong, powerful rhythm and rhyme to a completely another one 
for a long while. And then it would shift again to another and another. It had a very haunting, powerful, strained, and intricate cadence. And a, and a structure, and no musical accompaniment, and this just this powerful intonation with this powerful rhyme and this powerful inborn rhythm. And when Mahmoud came out, I asked him, Mahmoud, what is that music you're listening to? And he quickly flicked off the tape. And he told me, uh, it's not music. And I said, well, then what is it? And he says, it's the Quran. Now, up until that point in my life, I had never heard the Quran. I had read in a translation, and I thought it was powerful and compelling and beautiful. I thought it was philosophically great, tremendously rational and coherent, deep and profound, but I had never heard it recited. But when I heard it recited for the first time, I thought, I said to Mahmoud, is it all like that? Does it all have such a powerful, innate rhythm and this very intricate and powerful rhyme? And Mahmoud said, uh, yes. And I said, is it poetry? And he said, no. I said, then what is it? He said, Arabic, po Arabic po poetry has a very definitive style. This is not anything like Arabic poetry. Normally, when I used to have conversations with Mahmoud about his faith, I, used to, I would usually fi file, you know, keep on going and asking him more questions. But at that point, I asked him nothing else. Because I just needed to sit there and try to piece all the pieces together. Because when you study literary works, poetry, for example, that has tremendous rhythm and tremendous rhyme and very uh, strict structure, usually when you translate it, that into another language, it loses much of its power. The meaning becomes almost trite. But here we have something that has the most powerful, intricate, disciplined rhythm and rhyme throughout the entire Quran. And when you translate it into my language, it's still beautiful, powerful, compelling, rational, deep. I couldn't believe that the same thing I was reading could possibly be the same thing I heard in Arabic. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. You will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up as, with snow. You translate that into Arabic, I'm sure the Arabs in the audience are not going to think that's really great or profound. But it's a beautiful poem in English. It was in just sunny clime where I used to spend my time, a servant of, his majesty, the, of Her Majesty the Queen. And of all that black-faced crew, the finest man I knew was a regimental disty Gunga Dean. Right? Famous poem, right? But if you translate that into Eng to another language, it'll lose much of its compelling beauty, you know, much of its power. But this, the Quran, which had this powerful rhythm, systematic rhythm, this innate rhythm that makes it so easy to memorize even, <clears throat> that, that has this beautiful and powerful and compelling music and rhythm throughout it and rhyme that shifts and changes. It's not even consistent. One surah it'll be this way, another surah, maybe a long one will start this way and then slowly glide into another and then slowly glide into another and then slowly glide into another. You know, most great poets when they write, they write in two or three meters in rhythms and that's it. And all their poems are in one or the other. This one is shifting dramatically and intricately throughout the high, entire Quran. There might be a 150, maybe 200 different meters and styles and rhythms and rhymes throughout the Quran. I thought, how can this author do this, coming from the environment that he did? How could he produce something this, this magnificent? Especially it's coming from a very primitive, simple, simple unrefined, un backward, primitive society. I thought he either must have transcended his time and space like no other person in the history of the world, or, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Maybe there was a God. I wasn't really sure. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe my mom was right. Maybe there was a God. And that, through reading the entire Quran, and through these considerations, especially the ones I met, mentioned yesterday, but also just thinking about these issues as well, the doubt began to creep in. The more I thought about these things, the harder time I had reconciling 
my encounter with the Quran with my commitment to atheism. And I think I'll stop there because you guys must be tired. How did I do tonight? Did I take very long? Let's see, we started about here. Oh, 50 minutes. I'll stop there. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Like I said, this is just, I was just filling in some holes from uh, yesterday. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Professor Wang. Um, what we're going to do is we have a couple people who are going to kind of walk up and down the aisles and you're allowed to uh, write a question if you don't want to uh, come and stand in line over here. But if you don't mind uh, asking a question, um, we would like people to come and line up over here for, for questions. Thank you very much. Mainly because of the videotape. Um, this is going to the video feed. So you do not have to answer, ask any questions, by the way. Yeah, you don't have to ask. No questions, it's fine. We could just go home. <laughs> yes, sir. Just line up right here. Do you play football? Uh, no. <laughs> Basically, according to the, I'm not a Christian, I'm an agnostic, but according to the Christian faith, demons are smart. The devil's very intelligent. All the things that you say he could have done, therefore what you believe now could have been a, con he basically could have made, and therefore he's now leading many people to hell. Pardon, say that again? I didn't quite catch it. According to the Christian faith, the devil's uh, very smart. He's smart. Demons yeah. are, the devil yeah. is just incredibly smart and could yeah. do everything of what you said. Therefore, Possibly this could have been of his greatest work, and therefore many people are being led to hell. Oh, but I'm you're not an, a Christian, though, but you're I'm an agnostic. agnostic. But yes. Can I just ask then, what, what, what's the motivation behind the question? I'm just curious. You're fascinated. I'm just, just curious. I mean, how would you ask that? What? I mean, no, how do you answer that? Because you're obviously putting a supernatural element into it, and therefore, if that's how do you know if that supernatural isn't coming from the no, divine? No, I'm just of curious why uh, you would ask that uh, from an atheist, pers agnostic perspective. It's okay. No, I don't mind. Yeah. <clears throat> the question is, just in case you haven't heard it, and I hope I've phrased it correctly. Yes. Uh, according to the Christian faith, and this man is an agnostic, he's unsure of the existence of God, but he said according to the Christian faith, Satan is very smart. Yes. And he could do tremendous things. Yes. And, and he could produce great works. And so how do you know that Satan didn't produce this to deceive? Uh -huh. To what? To deceive and basically to lead deceive and people lead and, hell. and lead them away from God. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know. Well, let me say this: If this was the work of Satan, although you know in the Quran Satan is stripped of much of his power. You know, it says the guile of Satan is weak. You know, so there is a different religious perspective here. Hmm. Satan, but whispers, and so certain people follow them. He whispers into their heart. He's that source of temptation that they're exposed to, and he follows them. But he says in many places in the Quran, I had no power over you. You know, he's really sort of stripped of the power. So he doesn't have the same tremendous power that he has in Christianity, for example. Yeah. But nonetheless, how do I know that this couldn't be the work of some great evil force that was trying to uh, fool, deceive people, and to lead them away from the belief in God? Well, if Satan were so clever, and it was his design to produce this so it would lead them away from the belief of God and righteous living, then he failed miserably. You know, because there's a billion people down around the world, even to this day, that through the Quran are devout believers in one God. But therefore they don't believe in Jesus, therefore his master scheme would have worked because now people are going to hell, <clears throat> which therefore Satan likes. Well, maybe from the Christian perspective, but I'm yes. just saying from an outside perspective. Okay. You know, from an outside perspective, if it was Satan wanted to create something that would, that would get people to do evil, then he failed miserably. Because this, this same scripture has gotten people to live righteous lives, to dedicate themselves to doing goodness, to give up drinking, to give up sexual licentiousness, to give up all the things he supposedly wants us to do. You know, he's, got, he's gotten people to give up murder, to give up killing, to give up violence, to give up theft, to give up stealing, to give up lying, to give up cheating, to love God, to love his prophets, to love Jesus, you know, to, and on and on and on. If this was the work of a demon, then uh, I would say that Satan was a very good guy. Yeah. <laughs> 
well, okay. I'm talking from just uh, I'm talking from an outside perspective, not from any religious point of view. Are you following me? As an atheist, when I first read the Quran, you're asking me from the atheist perspective because I read it as an atheist. If this is the type of things that Satan is advocating, then he's a good person. You know, that would have been my reaction. Christian morality is similar too. What? Christian morality is very similar to. To, well, fine. So the Muslims do not discount that there's a lot of truth in Christianity, for example. You know, unlike other religions, the Quran, I mean, other, not other, other people, let me say, un un unlike certain people, the Quran does not, it does not say that only Muslims will enter paradise someday. It says that people of other scriptures will too, people of other religions can too, provided you know, that they're being sincere and that they are living according to what they truly know. Are you following me? Uh, I get what you're saying. You're coming from a moral perspective. So yeah. Like the possibility still exists. That if, you're saying, if you're saying that you would believe Satan would be a very good God, there's still the possibility exists that that could be correct. What could be correct? That obviously that could be correct by another thing. Well, no, I mean, unless I feel, I mean, for me, I mean, you remember, you're talking to me as a, per, as, and we're talking from, I hope we're talking, I mean, because I hope you're not saying, Jeff, put on the hat of a Christian and then approach this, you know, but I hope you're just saying that from a, say, objective level, you know, from an objective level, you know, couldn't this possibly be the work of Satan? And like I said, that my response would be that he is a very good being. You know, because he wants us to do all these good things. Um, the other thing I was going to say that if it, uh, no, I guess I'll leave it at that. I ran out of gas. <laughs> but uh, what was the other thing? Oh, yeah. But if, you know, Satan's only real concern is to get people to either acknowledge, to accept or not accept the belief in the divinity of Jesus, and that's his only real concern, then I would think that it, then God really is kind of cruel and Satan is really not so bad if that's his only real concern because you know if all my if I'm just down here on earth for no other purpose than to acknowledge the sonship of Jesus and that's what all this strife and struggle and everything on this earth is about if that's the only reason I'm here God put me here for no other purpose than to acknowledge that. Then I'm sorry, I can't see that the, the, even the necessity of all of this. No. no, that's coming from the atheist perspective. Yeah, because it's incompatible with it would be incompatible with how I would reason. Yeah, because you know, because then I would have to start asking that person questions, and I've been in these conversations many times, and as I start asking them questions. Their, their reasoning for, for that position starts to fall apart. And the only thing they could tell me finally is that, well, I mean, it's a matter of faith. You know, and that's what inevitably becomes. But I don't want to stand here and attack the Christian perspective well, tonight. I mean, I've also known people, for example, the Yvette Carlini, the Austin, where it's different than that. They both did, for example, a very negative way of looking at Jesus. They had a concept of, you know, the God who looked like the idea of the concept of how great no, that's fine. I was just presenting, you know, I was just presenting a rational perspective, that's all. All right, we're going to go with the next question. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm also agnostic, and are, are after you, this whole Matt thing, Matt? Um, uh, I agree with Matt. Oh, Matt. Who's Matt? Um, <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain, but, well, I Who's mad? Yeah, go for it. Um, there was a, a, a rally, I guess, about a week or week or two ago, um, that a guy, who had, a, a guy who had found Christianity. A um, guy who founded? Who found Christianity as his oh. belief. His name was Matt, and there was a big rally where they were putting signs, I agree with Matt everywhere, because they, they oh. wanted to uh, get people to come and listen to him speak about his, his uh, conversion. So. Oh, okay. I don't know about it, but go ahead. Well, my point is, um, one of the things I talked to them about uh, uh, was that 
the whole point, and I'm not a, in any way an expert about Christianity or whatever, so uh, probably a lot of people are going to contradict me, but they were saying that um, even though I might be a really good person and that I spend my life doing good things and I'm moral, et cetera, et cetera, the fact that I don't believe in Jesus means I'm going to hell regardless of whatever I do. How do you um, feel about that? Not very good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I was wondering if you could speak to uh, in comparison to Christianity is that Christianity is very exclusionary yes. towards other religions. Well, At least that's my impression. Okay. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to that from more um, of the perspective of Islam. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I'm not going to characterize Christianity as exclusionary or not. That's not my role here today. I'm not a Christian. <clears throat> I don't want to offend people and it's not necessary. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that first appeared, appear, uh, one of the things that appealed to me about the Quran was that it was not so exclusionary as you say. You know, in one verse it says, those people who follow this Quran and the Jews and the Christians and the Sabaeans, they were another monotheistic religion that existed at that time in the Arabian Peninsula. It says, those people who follow this Quran, and the Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabaeans, if they believe in God and do what is right, they'll have nothing to fear, nor shall they grieve. You know, and I found that to be a very compelling <coughs> statement. It said that it's not so much the religious label you have attached to us, but it's a question of sincerity and living a, right, uh, living a good and righteous life. The Quran, on the other hand, says that when people are confronted with the truth and if they stubbornly reject it and turn their back on it, they will be responsible for that. That will affect who they are. It will affect their spirituality. It will affect them as a person. So the stubborn and contumacious rejection of the truth, are you following me? Not just not knowing, not just being unexposed to it, or not just having somebody say to you, oh, well, you know, I'm a Muslim, I believe this, uh, there was a prophet, etc., and he explains it, he or she explains it in a way that you cannot relate to at all, or does a bad job of relating it. You know, if that's your case, and you still remain ignorant of the truth from the standpoint of the Quran, you know, then God only knows, you know, you may be fine. You know, I really don't know. But the only sin that the Quran says will utterly destroy a person, for sure, is the stubborn and contumacious re rejection of God and truth. When they sense it. Are you following me? Yeah. Oh, I don't mean to yell at you. I want them to hear me back there. You know, so that will do it. When people put, it says in the Quran, other things before truth and before uh, a genuine, sincere, open-minded search for God. When they put other things before that, make it, raise that to a higher level and make it more important, then the Quran refers to that as in Arabic shirk, associating with God, making other gods before God, inventing your own gods before God, right? Or putting your own lust or desires, and it gives these examples, lust, desires, wealth, power, etc. When you make that your God, and, you've, and in your stubborn resistance of the truth, to hang on to that, that becomes the center of your life, you're destroying yourself, the Quran says. You know. But you know, as that verse says, if there is a Jew, Jewish person, or a, as the example shows, if there's a Jewish person, or a Christian person, or a Sabine, who is sincere, and is uh, doing good deeds, righteous, living righteously, and that to the best of their ability, they are trying to pursue truth and live a good life, then as long as they believe in God and they have uh, lived righteous lives, they have nothing to fear, nor shall they grieve. You know? So it has a certain, you know, and uh, other verses say a person is not responsible for, for will not be, uh, will not suffer for what they do in ignorance, in true ignorance. But like I said, you know, I don't want to downplay the point that the Quran also says that when people are confronted with the truth, they're responsible to, to they should not just turn their back on it. You know, 
in no uncertain terms it says that. Okay. So I hope that's okay. Nice question. I, I didn't mean to raise my voice. Thank you. Um, there's just been a request uh, from some of the picker-uppers to pass the questions down to the front if you if you have that ability, if you happen to be in a line where you can reach people. Um, going to go through... Who uh, is Matt? Matt? Matt. I'm going to go through two or three quick uh, uh, written ones. Sure. I'll, uh, but I'll have to be quick about those. Right. Yeah. First thing is... Uh, Thank you for your exposition. As a professor of mathematics, how would you further expand the Quranic theory of creation, kun fa ya kun, with the Big Bang theory of creation, including includes expanding universe and ultimate big crunch? Oh, uh, well, I'm a mathematician. I'm not a physicist. But uh, also, I, I've never thought about that question from that angle. And you know, it, w it would require some thought. You know, I, I've never really thought about that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, let's see. Not trying to belittle the question, I've just never given it any thought. Uh, number one, other religions also preach goodness and good things. For, a pers for the person who is not looking at specifics and rational approach of the Quran, why do you think or do, or do you think people need the guidance that the Quran provides? <clears throat> I think there's a lot of people who have lived lives similar to mine, who have questions like I have. You know, and I think um, a lot of people in the, spe in the West especially have come to doubt the existence of God primarily for rational reasons. And from my experience of the Quran, I believe that, that many of those people, if they read it with an open mind and an open heart, that it may help them in their search. I sincerely feel that. I wouldn't be standing here today if I didn't. So, what was the question again? Uh, essentially, uh, why do you think people need the guidance the Quran provides? Yes, and you know, so I think it could be of a benefit for many, many people, hopefully, and I think they would find great peace, and I think they would find much more than that, you know, through reading the Quran. You okay. know, especially, uh, yeah. This person uh, seems to have had encounters with Christians who have said that their belief in, in the Trinity and their belief in Jesus as God is one of faith and, um, and that they just take it on faith, that that, that is true. Uh, is there a way to present the Quran or its teachings to them considering you're coming from that faith should make sense? Coming from what? The faith? The, the idea that faith should make sense. Oh, yeah. well if a person is, I don't know what, I can't, see, I can't, I wasn't there when you had this conversation, whoever asked that question. From your point of view, you understood that when you tried to reason with them and tried to apparently argue with them and point out certain, what you felt were rational problems with their position, when you tried to do that, they finally said to you, it's a matter of faith. It's just a matter of faith. Uh, and, you know, in other words, that in some sense, you know, reason has not much to do with it. And that reason could lead you astray or whatever. If that's a person's position, that's their position. You know, I mean, I've gotten into such discussions with people before, friends of mine, and they said, well, it's just a matter of faith. That's a premise. I mean, it may or may not be true. You know, the Quran says that faith is intricately related to reason. Reason is indispensable. If somebody says to me that reason has nothing to do with faith, I have no argument against The argument must stop there. So the minute you throw reason out, then you have, there's no point in arguing. There's no point in even discussing. There's no point in debating the issue. If you throw out reason, then what's the point of arguing? Arguing is an exercise in reason. Are you following me? So you really have nothing to say. You could just say, well, then, you know, then God gave you reason for no real purpose. Your reason doesn't have any real function in terms of, it was, he gave it to you for no real purpose. What can I say? You know, and, and if they admit that, then, then they're stuck. You know? We're going to go two quick ones because you won't have to say much for these and then we'll go to the back to yes. the line. Uh, how long did it take you for the first, from first reading the Quran to when you became a Muslim? It took me a while. <laughs> Not really all that long. It took me from the time I got done reading the Quran to the time I became a Muslim. Boy, it was so long ago, 19 years. But from the time I got done, maybe three weeks, four weeks. Um, 
Yeah, about three or four weeks. All right, and what was the last thing you thought about before deciding to convert? Really? Or accept Islam. Oh, wow, what was the last thing I thought about before com I don't know. Well, I know. Um, let me just say, just, hmm. Let me just say that, this. What essentially happened was I was done with the Quran. I was not, the, my study of the Quran really just sort of began as an intellectual curiosity, you know, a rational endeavor. Um, as I read through the Quran, I didn't tell anybody this last night because these are not the type of things that are going to help anybody. And I don't think this helps people in their search for God. And uh, so I haven't mentioned it. I mean, my own personal experiences. Uh, I could talk about what I went through with reason, but I don't want to tell people what I experienced uh, on a spiritual level. Because I can't communicate that to you. You have to sort of either go through it yourself or what. It's not something that we could reason about. Uh, <clears throat> but in any case, my study of the Quran, as you might have observed yesterday, began as a rational endeavor. But as I read through it, I slowly but surely, slowly but surely began to take on certain spiritual dimensions. Uh, as I read through the Quran, the further I got through it, the more, the greater I began to doubt my atheism. And the more I started to doubt atheism, the more open I became to the possibility of God's existence. And the more open I came to the, I think as the more open I came to the possibility of God's existence, the more I found that the passages in the Quran started to move me in very powerful ways. I mean, there were times when I would read the Quran and I would just feel this tremendous presence, spiritual presence about me. There were times in the, when I would be reading the Quran and I'd be moved to tears and I would cry. I remember after I read the surah that was first recited here today, I, cr I cried like a baby for a half hour. And I don't know what happened. I don't even know where those tears came from. They just poured out of me for a, for a good half hour. I just sat kneeling on the floor with my head near to the ground and the tears just came gushing out of me. It was like I was let, just letting go. So much pain and so much hurt, so much anger, so much suffering, it just came out of me. There were times when I read the Quran that I just felt uh, that I was in the presence of this tremendous power and mercy. And the more I got through the Quran, the more I began to doubt my atheism, the more powerful those experiences became. And so, you know, and when they kind of first would start happening, I'd try to shake them off. Because they never came when I wanted them to come. They just sort of came, you know, unanticipated. And I, I just, at first I did shake them off. I just blew them off. I said, you know, it must be something psychological going on here. You know, and I, by the time I finished the Quran, I had these experiences. I had them repeatedly. They were powerful. They were unanticipated. They were recognizable. But I just uh, left them aside tried to ignore them. And then in those three or four weeks that passed, and I know this is not a rational explanation, it's not going to help anybody here, but in those three or four weeks that passed after that, uh, when I wasn't reading the Quran anymore, I started to feel a, a loneliness and a kind of longing. I missed that voice that spoke to me through the Quran. I missed the experience. I felt I had lost I felt a great sense of loss and isolation. And, you know, the as time went on. I missed it more and more as the weeks went past. I was tortured by it. And at some point, I realized that there's just no point in denying it anymore. You know, the Quran had awakened in me a spirituality that I thought I never had. And through that spirituality, it spoke to me. It spoke to me, a, a part of me that I never thought I had. And as the weeks went by and I missed that voice and I missed that experience, I came to finally realize that what I missed was God. And I know that sounds like a big leap, but once you're moved by that and touched by that, 
and you have that experience, you, know, this, you just know it. There's no point in denying it anymore. And so, you know, maybe I had to get all that rational baggage out of the way. Maybe I just had to open the door a little bit of, of the possibility, entertain the possibility of God's existence. But once I did, I had some very powerful, moving, spiritual, quote-unquote, spiritual experiences. And it, and it reached into a part of me that I didn't know was there. And so, and so on November 8, 1982, I went over to talk to the Muslim students, students of the University of San Francisco because they had a mosque in their basement there. Basement of the church. Had a little mosque, a little prayer room. And I went down there telling myself I was going to only ask a few questions, that I definitely wasn't going to become a Muslim. But I went down there just to talk to them, to just talk with somebody about what I had been through. And I went down there, and a half hour later, I came out a Muslim. And uh, so at that point, it seemed like it happened without my even wanting it to. You know, so I could give you all the t I could try to rationalize my conversion to Islam. I could rationalize how I uh, overcame my rational objections. I could rationalize about how I developed questions about the author. But I honestly, and I apologize for this, I cannot rationalize how I became a Muslim. What finally made me need that so badly. You know, I wrote in one book of mine that, and maybe this is the best way to say it, that the nearest and truest answer I could really give you when all is said and done is just this, that at one special moment of my life, a moment that I never could have conceived when I was younger, I think God in his infinite kindness and wisdom just had mercy on me. And I don't know why, you know, maybe he just saw in me a, a pain so deep, an emptiness so vast, a longing so great, I really don't know why. But maybe he just saw in me a readiness. But, you know, that's the best I could do. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. We get these questions here. Hi. Um, when you talk about the Quran being inspired, um, from yes, I, I listened to, to last night as well. And oh, yes, sir. Some of, it seems like a lot of the things that, that you talked about in the Quran and that I've seen in the Quran, aren't they? Um, really similar to things in the Bible, like uh, a story you told last night kind of reminded me of the book of Job with the, the angels. I mean, not, not exactly the same, but just um, questioning God and also a lot of uh, Muhammad's teachings, aren't they similar to Christ, if not like uh, not doing alms before men to be seen yes. of them, aren't they? Yes. So how... Um, Yes, and Confucius, and you know many other great religious teachers. Yeah, what would uh, what would separate the Quran, like as far as just the moral um, the moral tenets that it has? What would separate the Quran from from like the New Testament or or other writings? Like what what would make that uh, what special? Do you mean on a moral level? Well, isn't that what originally you were con you were concerned about? You said like um, it was just beautiful in the way that it. It taught people how to. Uh, you know, Tonight, to yeah, I talked life. about that. Yeah, yeah. On a moral level, like, I'll start. You could interrupt me when you want. On a moral level, you know, both scriptures, many of the scriptures around the world, teach you know goodness, living, you know, being good, worshiping one God or a supreme being, etc. And and that it, it conforms to the whole picture of revelation in the Quran, because the Quran says that. You know, God has revealed the truth to many people of many nations in many times, and that, you know, that all mankind at this point in history right, has been exposed to the truth at one, t at one time in their past. Every nation has had a messenger, the Quran says. You know what I mean? So it would be not surprising to a Muslim then that the moral teachings and the ethical teachings of the great world religions intersect in many ways. Are you following me up till mm -hmm. now? Because the, there's the same God behind them all. The, what the Quran does say about them that is that along the way though, in the past, the other scriptures have been in some sense corrupted. So that some of those truths have been mixed with things that are not from God. 
Are you following me? Mm -hmm. And so the necessity of this revelation. Okay? Uh, so the Quran says it is a confirmation of, confirmation of the truth that came before it and a correction of certain things that were corrupted. Um, that's, that's how, the, that's how uh, the Quran sees itself in relation to the other scriptures. The thing that I found different from the Quran, you know, unique about the Quran, because you did ask me that just now. The thing I found unique about the Quran was what I talked about last night, truly unique, was that it's tremendous stress on reason and the integral role, that fundamental role that reason plays in the attainment of faith and, and in the pursuit of truth. And that I found that, and not only it's stress, but it's very ra rational and almost didactic way it leads you and guides you, hopefully, to truth and to God. Uh, I, mean, I hate to, to open the can of worms of faith and reason, Sorry. but um, if, if something is reasonable and logical, does it really take a whole lot of faith to believe it? I mean, if it makes no. perfect sense to you. Well, yes, <laughs> it really does. Because, at least it did for me, you know, because as much as the Quran was reasonable and logical, you know, when I first started, I mean, the whole idea of becoming a Muslim, you know, or embracing this Quran and its message. I mean, you know, here I had this message, you know, that I really started to sense was truth. Here I had, you know, my reasons for not believing in God sort of stripped away. Here I, you know, had, you know, thought about my past and felt that I almost, if I reviewed my past, there were moments when I had almost a natural inclination or instinct for belief in God. You know, in moments of crisis or fear, you know, when you suddenly, you know, suddenly it seems like you know God better than anybody else. Oh, God, help me, or things like that. You know, I mean, everything in the Quran pointed to, to me, you know, led me to believe certainly God could exist, probably God does exist, Still, I was unwilling. The biggest problem I had was I cannot become a Muslim. I cannot embrace this message. Because even though it appealed to me rationally, I was working at a Catholic school at that time, the oldest Catholic school in America. And I thought I was untenured, and I thought I would lose my job. I thought my parents would come down on me. I would have not, my parents would isolate me, would not approve of it, especially since they were devout Catholics. I thought my friends would, th would think I went Arab crazy in San Francisco. You know, I thought, I thought that this is a religion associated with terrorists and backwards people and, and uh, murderers. And you know, my colleagues would start thinking I lost my mind. Especially conversion. I mean, a math professor is not supposed to convert to anything. You know? <laughs> Seriously, mathematicians, we're supposed to be, you know, totally, you know, that, that's beyond us. You know, we're, we're way superior to that. You know, religious belief is, you know, trying to be a devout person of any religion and work in a math department, people look at you as lost your mind. You know, even to this day, I don't, I don't even hardly bring up the issue in the math department. I, I just keep it low key. You know, because I know my colleagues will think I'm crazy. You know, so all these, there were all these sort of personal problems with embracing this message. And they were my biggest barrier to doing that. And that's what the Quran talks about. You know, it says that, you know, people refuse to listen to this message, reject it out of hand, oppose it, try to find every reason not to believe it because of their own personal wants and desires are suddenly going to be all messed up, you know, they're going to suddenly be under attack. And people fear that. And then, and you know, I certainly did. And so it definitely wasn't easy for me, and I know for tons of fellow converts like myself that have embraced this religion, it wasn't easy for them either, for the very same reasons. They feared their job, they feared the loss of their family, they feared the loss of their friends. Maybe it's all imagined. And it turned out everything I thought was going to happen, happened to a tiny degree. But, you know, nothing like I imagined. I imagined much worse. My parents were a little upset, but they still loved me. My friends, well, I lost some, but I gained others. Uh, they didn't fire me from work like I thought they would. I got tenure and promoted. Then I moved from there to another university and got promoted, again, you know, to full professor. But, you know, all these disasters, I thought I would never get, be able to find a woman to marry. And God, I found a woman from Saudi Arabia and I got married. You know? So, so I'm sorry I took too long. Do you have anything else? No, thank you.
Okay, thank Thanks. you. Appreciate it. Man, that was a good question. <laughs> yes, um, well, I kind of have like a quick question. Uh, did it ever cross your mind that you might be overloading the Quran with logic and reasoning and... Uh, Overlooking it? Overloading it. Like oh. what I mean by that, like uh, if you have some verses talking about, say, uh, the earth or heavens. Yeah. And, yeah. So did it ever cross your mind that it might be just a coincidence and you're oh, just, as definitely. a mathematician, you're thinking of it definitely. this way? But when I, you're talking about the signs in the Quran. Yeah. yeah, when I read the signs in the Quran, I only thought they sounded very interesting. Are you following me? Yeah. I did not think it's, this verse is definitely talking about the expansion of the universe here. You know what I mean? It piqued my curiosity, made me wonder, but I'm, you know, as a scientist, I wasn't going to say this is an explicit statement of any particular theory. I just found the wording extremely intriguing. Are you following me? Yeah. So I was not one of those person to, to, you know, really say, oh yeah, this is definitely this. And of course, you have to remember, I was an atheist at that time. I was already skeptical. I just found, but I have to admit, I found the wording very intriguing at times. And it piqued my interest and kept me going. You know, kept, kept me wanting to go further. Are you, you know, are you following me? Yeah, what about the stories like when you say that you take them as, okay. Allegory and et cetera? What about the stories that you take them as uh, symbolic instead of like historic? Yeah. Like some people might be actually disagreeing with you that sure. they might be taken as, they, they must be take taken as, as history historic. and et cetera. So do you think it's like uh, wrong to have like a certain verse that people are uh, looking at it in a different way? I think people, you know, if I approached a certain verse and reacted a certain way, I think people, Muslims for example, should be open to that, you know, because I'm going to get the same moral and spiritual truth from that story that they are. Are you following me? And I have to be open to their interpretation as well. And as the Quran said, you know, don't seek discord, don't argue, you know, don't let this become a rift between you, such arguments, you know, over whether this one is allegorical or this one is not. Explicitly says, don't, you know, the, the people with diseased hearts do that, you know. So, you know, this uh, because of the Quran style, because of certain, many things it said, like I spoke about last night, the role of symbolism in the Quran. Yeah, maybe I, I admit I might be dead wrong. I might be reading it dead wrong. But you know, I you have to remember when I was reading it, I was reading it from a critical perspective. But I always, I, I don't have many good qualities. But I think the one good quality I have is I'm fair. <laughs> and my students always tell me I'm very fair. You know? And even when I, my wife is arguing with my daughters, and I get in between them, and they're both ready to kill me by the time I've mediated, they all admit that I'm very fair. You know, I could just take myself emotionally out of the situation and just sort of look at it and analyze it rationally, you know, and point out to them each of their points rationally. So when I read the Quran, and I'm looking to criticize it, and this is the way I look at anything when I read it from a critical perspective. I always try to be fair, not to impose on the scripture or whatever I'm reading an interpretation that forces a contradiction when such an interpretation or such an imposition is not absolutely warranted. Are you following me? And so that's the way I read the Quran. I was, get, I was determined to be open-minded. You know, maybe I bent over backwards to be so. But I was determined to be open-minded. You know, the same way I read everything else I've ever read about religion. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oops, this thing is killing me. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a question uh, concerning um, you described yourself a certain way uh, when you were an atheist, as far as um, how you felt uh, about yourself, you know, internally. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to know was, over the last 18 or 19 years, um, how has that changed? and how would you describe yourself now? And what exactly, if there's one aspect of your faith that has uh, contributed more to your spiritual development, what would that have been? Like, would it have been prayer? Would it have been, you know, something in that respect? Oh, shucks, that's a great question. I haven't even thought about that. Uh, have I changed? Well, I've gotten older, but, you know, so that changes you. But has, you know, this experience of becoming Muslim changed me in any essential way? Uh, I don't, I'd have to rely on my friends' opinions for that. I do know that my friends from the, in the past used to tell me that I had a certain sadness about me a lot. That uh, in, when I was in my early 20s and in my teenage years, 
I seemed to, uh, they said I was a very nice person. I used to make cookies for them. <laughs> I really did. Cakes. I was a very giving person, really. You know, even though I thought it was a doggy dog world. Up here, I thought, you know, this world is just a violent place and everything like that. But I tried to make it at least as peaceful around me and as enjoyable as I can. You know, and you know, I, you know, even though I thought, it, you know, I should just protect myself and not give to other people, like my father taught me. On the other same time, my mother's influence was strong, and I just had a need to, to lend people a helping hand. You know. And plus, I found that pursuing wealth, even back then, and pursuing money and pursuing material things, just left me feeling empty back then. You know, so I was a searching person back then. Not searching for God or searching for religion, just searching for peace and happiness, I think. And my friends tell me that back then I just seemed uh, unsettled, un un unhappy. You know, I just feel disconnected. You know. That's the way they used to describe me back then. My friends now, because I don't know how I appear to others, you know, but my friends now tell me that I seem at peace with myself. They say I seem happy. You know, they tell me I seem together. You know, they, as far as what has affected my growth spiritually, and I'm not holding myself up as some kind of model. I'm here just to present some rational perspective, I put some rational perspective on the Quran. So I'm not going to say I became some saint or something. But what has affected whatever growth I have had is prayer has played a major part. You know, the, the prayer five times a day has had a tremendous influence over me. Some of those prayers, I mean, it's just really hard to describe. You know, but those, but the prayer five times a day, seven days a week, every day for the rest of my life, getting up before dawn, praying at evening, praying at noon, afternoon, and right after sunset. Just doing that every day and trying to follow this program that the Quran describes, it has, it has just made me more and more receptive to those type of experiences I told you about. You know, made me more and more spiritually sensitive, I'll put it that way. You know, and it has made it easier for me to deal with life. You know, I see some of the other parents in my uh, department. Oh, my son and daughter did this and this and this, and they come in frantic. And my children make mistakes. I have an older daughter. She is the most rebellious, brilliant, genius, headstrong, nutcase in the world. Uh, erase that from the tape, by the way. <laughs> but. But, you know, and she does crazy things and shocking things. But, you know, I, I just, I think it'll be okay. One, you know what I mean? And even if it's not, it's not all in my hands, you know? Some kids need to go through, just my whole way, just nothing seems to rattle me anymore. You know, I'll say that much. But I don't want to hold myself up as some sort of exemplar or so, somebody that you should aspire to become or anything like that. But becoming, a, being a Muslim has, has, whether you think I'm deluded or not, it has uh, given me a lot of peace and serenity. Yeah. Okay? Thank you for the question. Um, okay, yes, we're going to go to some written ones. Yeah. Aren't you guys tired yet? Don't you want to go home? If anybody sees me putting questions over yeah. here on this pile, it's not because I, oh, I don't want to have yeah. asked that. Some of them he's answered through his speeches. Um, okay, uh, just a quick one here. What does the Quran have to say about man's relationship with nature, in your opinion? I'm trying to think about it. Uh, I haven't really thought about that very much. I really haven't. You know, it's not something I thought deeply about, so I can't do much on that one. Uh, you may, you can. You should it. honor nature. I know that. You should respect it very much. Yeah. You know, because the Quran shows that you should have so much reverence for nature. Right. So, you know, verse 29 about Bakra says that yeah. it was all put here for us to yes. serve us. Yeah. So, you know, man should respect nature, be its caretaker. You know and have tremendous uh, respect for it, you know, yeah, not... You don't have to answer this. This was probably answered more last night, but you may have something to say. Why do you think some people suffer more and some suffer less? Is it fair? Yes. <laughs> no, I don't know really why always some people suffer more, some people suffer less. I think we all suffer quite a bit, you know. At the same time, we have different personalities. Some of us could take more and some of us could take less. 
It says in the Quran that God tests no soul beyond its capacity. You know. Um, the Quran also says that when we enter the next life, when we arise in the next life, it often compares it to the way we awaken from a dream. It talks about the illusory character of life. It says life is just pomp and illusion. It shows that when the believers arise on the day of judgment and they're asked, how long have you suffered there on earth? They'll say, did we suffer there an hour or a day or less than that? And those who really know, it says in the Quran, will tell you, you suffered there but little, if you only knew. You know, for a short time, if you only knew. So the Quran, in many, many verses, talks about the illusory character of life. In one verse, it explicitly compares the person coming, uh, the way a person is resurrected from the, on the day of judgment, and the way a person um, awakens from a dream. Uh, in the, when it talks about the day of judgment and when people enter the next life, it says how they come out of their sleeping chambers, how they will swoon and be groggy, how their vision will first be blurred like the way you awaken from a dream, and then it will become sharp and they'll see the reality. Uh, it says that people will, you know, sort of stumble like the way you stumble out of bed in the morning, and then, you know, rush to where they are determined to go, you know, where they ultimately will have to go and so forth. The images in the Quran, and I know they're, I believe they're symbolic because it's talking about the Day of Judgment, something beyond this perception, indicate, and there are explicit statements that indicate, that this life, as real as it seems to us, and it is real, will seem when we enter to the next life very much like a dream, like awakening, say, for example, from a dream or a nightmare. You know? So that all the puffed suffering we went through, all the pain we went through, all the agony we fent, went through will suddenly seem like it's just a distant and vague, harmless memory. Are you following me? Because, um, you know, when you're living in a nightmare, when you're having a nightmare at night, and you're living it, and your heart is beating a thousand beats a minute, and you're suffering through that nightmare, and you're, you know, you're in a panic, and etc., and you awaken from that nightmare, and suddenly, you, you know, you're still nervous, and then you, you realize you're awake, and you're in the greater reality, and you say to yourself, oh my God, it was only a nightmare. It was only an illusion. It was only a dream. You know, the Quran indicates that when we awaken in the next life, our experience will be very similar. All the pain, all the hardship, all the agony will just seem like it was a brief, momentary illusion. Even though it was very real, even though it shaped what type of creature we enter, the, what type of being we enter the next life as, all the suffering, all the agony that we went through will be erased. Now, there's a famous saying of the prophet, peace be upon him, that says that when a believer puts his toe, steps into heaven, and he's asked to recall all the suffering that he's gone through on earth, he'll not remember any of it. And when a, when a rejecter of God puts steps into what faces him in the next life and is asked to recall all the joys and indulgences and the things he pursued and he enjoyed in this life, he will not be able to recall any of it either. You know? So in both cases, it'll seem like a distant, vague event but for those whose balance of goodness is heavy, to use a Quranic terminology, in the next life, when they enter that next life, all the suffering they went through will seem very inconsequential, like awakening from a dream in this life. So that's one thing you have to remember, that regardless of who you are, whatever agony you're going through, right now it seems like there's these great differentials and things like that, but when we enter the next life, it's all going to seem relatively insignificant to all of us. It's all going to seem insignificant to all of us. The second thing you have to remember is that the Quran does tell us that we, got, we do face tests in this life. That God does manipulate the human situation. Puts us into situations where we're forced to face sometimes hardship, sometimes ease. Sometimes we're forced, we're forced into making critical moral choices. He definitely manipulates the human drama but he leaves the critical choices up to us. And he said such things like sometimes he brings suffering on those who reject faith so that perhaps they'll use their reason or so that perhaps they will recall 
or so that perhaps they will reflect on their situation. It also says sometimes he brings ease upon them and, and drowns them in what they're pursuing, drowns them in their lustful pursuits, drowns them in their material pursuits, hopefully so that they'll realize the purposelessness of it, the aimlessness of it, the agony of it, the chaos of it. Again, so that perhaps they will reflect. But regardless of whether you're good or bad, the Quran guarantees it. You will definitely suffer. Because this life, it, you are going to face adversity. Because through adversity, you grow. My high school football coach used to tell, hand a pl put a placard on the wall, no pain, no gain. If you're going to grow physically, you've got to suffer. You know, if you want to become a great athlete, you want to become physically fit and powerful, you've got to suffer pain. No pain, no gain. My high school teachers used to tell me, Jeff, or students, you've got to work hard, you've got to struggle, you've got to sacrifice, you've got to do everything you can, study hard, work hard. I know it's not easy, you've got to do it, but to grow intellectually, you've got to pay the price, they used to say. Well, the Quran says that the same laws of cause and effect, the same way God has measured the universe, to use a Quranic terminology, in terms of our intellectual growth and our physical growth, any type of growth applies to spiritual growth as well. No pain, no gain. You, know, you can't grow in mercy if there's not suffering, if you, are, if you know no suffering. You, know, you can't grow in compassion if you don't know suffering. You, know, you can't reach out to others if there's no suffering about you. You know, so it's an essential element of our growth. I think I said a lot about that last night, so I'll cut it quick there. I got carried away, sorry. That was a good question. Um, I have heard that the Islamic view on the Quran, oh, I want to mention one thing. Um, I, I don't think we're going to get through all these questions that have been handed in, but feel free still to hand them in. He does like to take them home. It helps him when in his writing, etc. If you want, I'll just keep the answers very short. Okay. okay. Uh, I have heard that the Islamic view on the Quran is that the Quran is the final revelation. It, um, it will be uh, kept unaltered. Why didn't God keep a previous revelation unaltered? Why did God wait until 640 AD and allow so many people who had lived previously to live without the truth? Why did he not? <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> no, I really don't. Uh, I think at that point in history, I mean, God only knows what type of people he is dealing with throughout history, you know. You know, God knows, you know, in the earlier history, if you, if you, you know, sort of, sort of example, when the Christianity came into being, you know, maybe God knew that it would spread to the Roman Empire and that it would be influenced by Roman beliefs, you know, in man gods and etc. You know, maybe he knew that. I, I really don't know, you know, to tell you the truth. The only thing I could say is that, you know, he picked, you know, a, he, he picked the right moment in history. You know, when man was on the, the verge of, uh, he picked, an, well, no, I really don't know. I have to think about it some more. I could tell you why, what necessit, what I feel necessitated the coming of, the revelation of this scripture. And I, I think I talked about that a little bit earlier. But why that particular moment in history, not 300 years later or 300 years earlier or 700 years later? I would assume it was the right moment in time when, the, when, civilization, when mankind was ripe for that. But, you know, I would, that would mean I'd have to have a knowledge that is beyond me. You know, the knowledge of human nature and the, all of humanity and the whole complex situation. And that really, right now, is just beyond me. Yeah. But I assume it was at the right moment in history, when a, when a community could carry that message and preserve it. Question, what could you say as to whether the Quran has ever been changed since its revelation? What? What could you say to whether or not the Quran has been changed since its revelation? Oh, it is not. Okay, what's the next question? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, for me that was not an issue, to be frank. Because by the time I was done reading the Quran, I had never gotten involved in the, in this, in the question of whether it was the preserved revelation received by the Prophet, peace be upon him. 
And the reason why I say that is because by the time I was finished, like I said before, I recognized that the personality behind these revelations was one. There was no other, it was obviously a singular personality. I had become convinced that that personality was God. So the question of the historical accuracy of the revelations was never, was just a side issue for me when I finally, uh, when I finally came to it. Uh, when I did come to it, the historians reported, and even many Western historians uh, re believed the same, that the Quran was compiled and organized and completely determined, you know, during the Prophet's lifetime. Uh, and as far as its order and its structure and everything, that was complete in, its life, in his lifetime. That after he died, his, uh, the community, you know, under the leadership of, uh, under the authority of its leader, Abu Bakr, his first successor, you know, had an official recension done, compiled, written, uh, completed, you know, a year or so after his death. Although most, there were many in the community that had it fully memorized as many, many Muslims do today. Many, it's very easy to memorize. Even I know a 30th of the Quran. I could memorize it by heart. And I, you know, and I wasn't born in an Arabian culture. It's extremely easy to memorize. Part of it, the reason why it's so easy to memorize is because of its, what I talked about before, its, it's meter and rhyme and et cetera. It makes it very easy to memorize it. It's very easy to memorize those type of things. You know, like a lot of people can't even speak English that could memorize American songs, you know, from front to back. I know kids that couldn't speak a word of English that could, could sing you Michael Jackson tunes, you know, an entire album. And it's much easier to memorize things of that nature. But in any case, the Quran was revealed over a 23-year period of the Prophet's life, the last 23 years. Um, his companions, he, the historians report that he taught his companions how to memorize it. They, they took it down in written, written form, that many of them had written records of the Quran. An official recension was done and collated and checked and double checked and triple checked after the, immediately after the prophet died, shortly after the prophet died within a year's time. Uh, another uh, critical check and examination was made again shortly after that, another 10 or 15 years, and many, many official copies were made and spread throughout the Islamic world because it was spreading far and wide. And, uh, and since then, uh, even uh, Western critics of Islam admit that for certain, after that period, there could have been no possible change. Because we have ver uh, versions of the Quran that go back to that very period. You know, so from a historical pers perspective, I guess, there's a great deal of certainty about the, that the fact that the Quran represents nothing more than the revelations which, even from a Western perspective, the, the Prophet proclaimed. So, you know, but that, like I said, that was not an issue for me. I was already convinced that it was from God long before I uh, stumbled on that. And that's not the reason why I believed it was. You know, but, you know, I was willing to accept that. There's no reason for me to doubt that. And like I said, a lot of Western historians, there are some that disagree. There are some that challenge that. And there are some that agree with that. But they're not my final authority either. You know, but in any case, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Uh, this is a little long. I'll try to uh, make it clear. You said yesterday that it is necessary for someone to become like another person in order to know and to love that person, and that we are meant to become loving, compassionate, forgiving, etc., like God. But you did not elaborate on exactly how it is possible for us to come to know. Uh, I, I assume God. Um, does God approach us through word or through presence or from a Muslim point of view? Does he approach us at all? And if not, in what way are we able to come to be like him at all? And then he makes a comment, Thomas Aquinas, a doctor of the Catholic Church from the Middle Ages, emphasizes the compatibility of faith and reason, as does the church, and has written a book called Faith and Reason. Um, I'm just remembering the one verse about God speaks to you from revelation, and inspiration, etc. So just to put that in your head, even though I know yes. you told me that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I know uh, about uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. The attack on uh, faith and reason began during the Renaissance. And after the Renaissance, that became an issue, the incompatibility of faith and reason. When the 
agnostic and atheist philosophers began to make an assault on the Christian religion, specifically. And uh, so it's a rather modern problem. Yeah, there were others as well, not just St. Thomas Aquinas. There were other of the church fathers that insisted on the compatibility of faith and reason. Uh, <clears throat> but I was talking mostly about the modern situation. Um, now, the uh, one about how does God approach us? Why? Oh yeah, I didn't say that you had to become like another person to be able to grow near to them. I was saying that what allows us to know another person is the type of things we share with them. Okay? And, uh, and I said that we can get to know another person, human being, because we have ex so many similar experiences. And the, more, and the more that we share with them, the closer we could get. That's how we could become intimate with another human being. And I said the problem that we face is how does one become intimate with God? When we are finite and he is infinite, when we are mortal and he is immortal, where he is transcendent and we are very much fixed in time and space, you know, limited by it, when, in almost, when he is, transcends the very environment that we are stuck in, you know, and where he has, you know, the, you know, where his being is so very different from ours. You know, how can we grow near to him? And I was telling him that what the, Quran, what the Quran indicates is that we could grow near to him, not so much through reason. Somebody left their glasses up here, by the way. We could grow near to him, not through much, so much just through ra reason, but we could grow near to him through experience. Because I said in the Quran, I'll just review it just quickly, it says in the Quran, the attributes of God, the most beautiful names of God, as it calls it. He is the merciful, the compassionate, the forgiving, the just, the kind. So in earth, the more we grow in forgiveness, the, more, the closer we grow towards God's forgiveness. The more we grow in compassion, the more we are able to receive and experience God's infinite compassion. The more we come to know of love, the more we can receive and experience God's infinite love, and so forth. Not just in ritual, which is one very intimate way to experience it, but in many ways else, and so much more when we reach the next life, when all the rational, when all the distractions are stripped away. You know, so I talked about that. Uh, when we experience mercy, for example, or any, uh, when we grow in the attributes that have God as their infinite and perfect source, it's not just a matter of experiencing them on a personal level. We experience something much greater. Because the Quran teaches us that God is the source of all the mercy, all the compassion, all the forgiveness, all the justice, all the truth that exists, period. So when we show compassion to another person, God's compassion is coming to that person through us. We become instruments of God's compassion. When we show mercy to another person, God's mercy is coming through us to that person. And for a, for, a, for a moment, we experience some of God's infinite mercy, a fraction of God's infinite mercy, as our own. So that other people experience God's being through us. And that is a level of intimacy that we cannot even attain with another human being. You know, I could, I can't walk in your shoes. You know, I can't experience what you experience. I might be able to relate to it by relating it to what I've experienced, but this is a much more intense intimacy because people are experiencing God's being through us and they're experiencing God's mercy towards them, God's compassion towards them, God's forgiveness towards them through, our, through us through us. And so we are experiencing that mercy and compassion and forgiveness, etc., as part of our own. You know, it's a level of intimacy that is extremely close, closer than we could achieve with any other being. But as I said, uh, through prayer and through other means, we also come to experience, as we become, grow in these attributes, grow in these qualities, and it's hard to summarize this in all two minutes. But as we grow in these qualities and follow this development and grow and, and grow in faith and grow in goodness through prayer and ritual and through and just moments in our life that, that are unanticipated, 
We experience God's presence, his nearness, his beauty. And this is something that it's hard to explain, but we experience them in very powerful ways that are more real for us than walking on the ground. But, you know, I don't know what else you want me to say about that. So we experience him through his presence, through his light, as the Quran says, through his beauty, through his power. We experience it in our lives in a very intimate way. Yes. I have a kind of an open-ended question, so I want to keep you talking uh, too, you too long. You want to keep me talking or not? No, no, not too long. Um, is I was wondering, how does the Quran address issues of diversity and more specifically things like race, um, gender, uh, sexual preference, etc.? cetera? Mm. Uh, if it does, and how so? Well, it doesn't, oh, let me see. Uh, does it address the issue of diversity in race, for example? Yeah. <laughs> You know, it said, oh mankind, we created you of different nations and colors and hues so that you will come to know one each other. Truly the most noble of you in the sight of God is he who is most virtuous, for example. You know, something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing, you know. And uh, throughout the Quran, you know, it stresses that we could have made you all homogeneous, all one. But we made, you know, but we, but, it, but we did not. It was not our intention. So vie with one another in doing good. Are you following me? And, uh, and so the point in the Quran, as far as racial diversity goes, is that it was God's intention to make people different because it's through, through dealing with people that are different from us that we have the greatest opportunities to grow. You know, it's easy to show compassion to my daughter. It's hard for me to show compassion to somebody who's very different from me, from a foreign land, or a wayfarer, as the Quran describes. You know, somebody that, and it stresses showing kindness to such people outside your natural environment. You know, those are the greatest tests and means to grow. Uh, let's see, um, f female, uh, male-female yeah, type things. Sure. Uh, the Quran talks about how men and women will both be in paradise. You know, how they have the same ethical and moral responsibilities and opportunity and spiritual opportunities to grow for men who surrender themselves to under God and women who surrender themselves under God for men who pray to God for women who pray to God for men who are devout for women who are it goes down this long list for men who do this women for this God has promised them forgiveness and a vast reward you know so there's that aspect of the Quran um, the what's the other one sexual preference sexual preference the uh, Quran really doesn't talk about that uh, so much. Uh, it does repeat the story of the people of Lot, you know, and it says that they engaged in all sorts of abominations, that they committed highway robbery, that they committed rape of uh, passers-by. In the story, the crowds from the people of Lot come and attack the, the visitors of the prophet Lot and want to take them and make use of them. And it says they committed atrocities in their public assemblies. And for that, God has destroyed them, you know, etc. That's about the only issue, you know, that it really deals with something close to what you talked about. Although I, I know, of course, every normal human being would object to uh, that, of course. But, you know, I'm talking strictly from the point of view of the Quran, you know. But it definitely condemns them for, for those, uh, for that, for what they did, the activity that they got involved in. And it does go into, uh, you know, does paint a very sorry picture of the people, I'll to tell you the truth. Alaikum uh, salam. I'd like to ask you, like, I'm a Muslim, but uh, some sisters ask me this question. After someone embra embraces Islam, could he get out of Islam and try to experience some other religion? Say that again. If someone embraces Islam, yes, could he get out of Islam and try to experience? Should he or religion? could he? Could he or could she or? Could he or could she? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're asking me, could he or could, she? Could he or she? I suppose it's possible. I mean, I've seen people uh, become Muslims in America and then become Buddhists thereafter and things like that. Some Americans just give it a shot. Uh, and, what, <laughs> and what about from the Islamic perspective? I mean, is it... The Quran says they definitely should not do that. You know, the Quran says that, you know, for those people who believed 
and then disbelieved, and then believed, and then disbelieved. You know, it says that God will, you know, they, that they will suffer severely. I can't remember exactly, but they will suffer severely for that in the hereafter. And you know, people make their religion a toy and believe and disbelieve and believe and disbelieve. Yeah, exactly. And why is that? Well, because they're taking the religion as a joke. You know what I mean? They're not being sincere at all. They're using the religion for their own gains. They believe when it's convenient. They disbelieve when it's... It's talking about certain people who believe when it suits their, their material purposes and then disbelieve when it doesn't. Are you following me? And then believe... So they're actually raising, they're making their material, their personal worldly needs, they're putting that before the worship of God. They're manipulating religion to serve their worldly needs. Which is, you know, exactly the opposite of what it should be. Are you following me? Yeah, but uh, you said, I think in the last lecture, that you have to experience it spiritually. So, I mean, the sister, she said she wants to experience spiritually over Islam, over Christianity, over Judaism. So she, she really wants to experience it, not, she just doesn't want to make it a toy, but she really wants to experience it. Oh. So now well, I think, you know, I can't. Tell, I can't tell her what to do. You know, if she would like, you know, I'm saying that, you know, the most important thing is not taking it as a toy. You know, I can't reach into her heart and know what her motivations are or what she's going through. I would probably have to talk to her about that. But you're asking me to answer way beyond what I could do just standing here listening to your question. But the most important thing is don't take a religion as, don't, you know, God, is, the Quran is telling us don't take the religion as a sport. You know, don't take it as something lightly. You know, these are serious matters. And don't especially use religion to serve your needs. Rather, you should serve God in your uh, pursuit of religion, not the other way around. Make God serve you in your pursuit of worldly gains. Okay? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, this Thank you for the letter question. says. Yes. Um, I unfortunately forget the author's name, but there is a book out now called The God Part of the Brain. This book claims that, that through evolution, humans have developed a belief in God, quote unquote, or a quote unquote higher morality for the sake of communal cooperation and survival. What is your argument to this? Also, when do you expect the next book to be finished? Thank you, and may Allah reward you, God willing. Uh, God Part of the Brain? I, I've never read that book, I'll tell you the truth. Um, I don't believe it. <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't believe we just developed this uh, system of uh, this idea of a supreme being just as a convenience. You know, but you know, I, that's just the theory. You know, and a, a rationalization and explanation of things. And you know, I, I could understand how you know somebody might devise that. I don't. I don't believe it's true. But you know, that person will. But the author of that will have to go through their own search, their own experiences. Will have their op the Quran the Quran points out they, they will definitely be presented opportunities when they will they'll be given opportunities presented with critical opportunities to rethink the whole idea of whether there is a God and whether it exists and what is truth and whatsoever. But you know, I can't correct everybody's. Uh, you know, I, since I don't believe in theory and I don't know about it, and uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I mean, these theories come across, come along all the time. They come into being, and then they, they, that one gets thrown out, and then another, and then that one gets thrown out. And, you know, I never found them very satisfying or appealing. Yeah. Um, do you want to take questions about like Islamic law? Oh, the book will. I don't know. Probably come out in about two years. Oh, the reason being is because I could only write it for about two hours a day. I, I could reserve two blocks, two hour block every day to write. That's all I have. Because I have a lot of work at the university. I'm also building ten houses right now. Because I got into a little bit of a side business so I could get my daughters married and through college someday. Because the university jobs don't pay a whole lot. And uh, in addition to that, I'm speaking like twice a semester. And I'm trying to raise three daughters. The, uh, the oldest one is as wild as could be, and uh, and she's a, intellectually she's an extremely great challenge, and I'm trying to be a good uh, husband to my wife, and with all that going, I really only have about two hours a day to do what I'm doing, and yet you know when I think of the prophet, peace be upon him, the prophet Muhammad, 
he was run, not doing, not only doing probably all those things, you know, things similar, had all those duties. He was also running a country. He was also uh, leading his uh, and, and developing a community. He was dealing with delegations all the time coming to him, uh, talking to people about this faith and etc. And uh, that was one thing that also made me question the authorship of the Quran because how if I could only it takes me two years, about four or five years, two hours a day to write a book, when would such a man have time to compose something so coherent and powerful, beautiful, intricate in its logic? You know, that was also a question. I just, I suddenly thought of it as I was talking to you here, as I was complaining about all the burdens that I have. But I won't get into that. I'll just say this, that uh, I can only write for about two hours a day. <laughs> um, through your studies of Islam, uh, what is the Islamic, what is uh, the Islamic view of Jesus' return to us before judgment and also a possible antichrist? Well, the belief in Jesus' return to, for judgment and the antichrist grew up in the Christian, developed in the Christian religion. Uh, the vast majority of Muslims, and I don't know if they've been affected by Christian converts or whatever, but the vast majority of Muslims, uh, I think, accept that to some degree. Uh, there are some that didn't. There were some Muslim commentators and some Muslim rationalists in the early history of Islam that did not accept those, uh, two, those two things you mentioned. They're not what Muslim scholars used to call essential beliefs. You know, the most you could say about them is the, va the majority of Muslims believe in them and they interpret certain uh, one or two verses in the Quran and think that it's pointing to them. Uh, there are, have been other Muslim scholars, and even modern-day sc Muslim scholars like Muhammad Assad, for example, and others uh, who have uh, n not accepted that and felt that that came from uh, Christian, in uh, Christian influence, the influence of Christian converts. Uh, I personally have my doubts about it, uh, but again, that's not, you know, I'm, I'm in a minority in that, but I have my own arguments, which I don't want to get into now, but, you know, it is a, uh, I would say in the Muslim circles, it is a debatable point in the sense that it's not something that another Muslim would say you're outside the boundaries of this faith. How do you feel about music in regards to Islamic law? Good or bad, right or wrong? Good or bad, right or wrong. Um, yeah, this is something uh, uh, that uh, has been debated a lot in the United States, especially among the African American Muslims. Uh, I've never really gotten in. See, I mean, to be honest with you, all these practical type of questions, uh, they've never really interested me. I'm not a practical thinker. You know, I don't like applications. Uh, and not that I don't like applications, I just don't have a mind for it. I've always sort of been sort of a theoretical type. You know, I like pure mathematics. Applied mathematics has always bored me. You know, so I'm not very good at getting down to earth on such issues. I've never really explored it very much. I'll say this much, that and I think an argument can be made an argument has been made against music, certainly in the past, by some Muslim s scholars and some eminent ones. And, uh, and, our, and arguments are, have been made on the other side, too, that uh, music, as long as it's not obscene, you know, or, uh, it, or songs or et cetera, that do not violate uh, Islamic principles, you know, is, if that's the case, then they're okay. I've heard arguments on both sides. I've heard the hadiths that were summoned on both sides. And uh, some are authentic, some are not. And a lot of it is a matter of interpretation. These are issues that, you know, I get, I tell you the truth, I get a little bored with. I'm sorry. Yesterday you talked about suffering. Yes. And we had to uh, suffer to be loving and compassionate, etc. Do yes. you think that you had to suffer during your childhood because of that? You also talked about forgiveness. Were you able to forgive your father? Who asked that question? <laughs> 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 that is such a great question. Yeah, did I have to suffer through my childhood? I asked, you know, I've asked my you're asking me right now, and now I'm asking myself for the first time. I don't know, I just never really thought of it. I guess so. You know, if I never had that childhood, I would have never come to know whatever I've come to know. You know definitely. You know, I, I, you know, as you ask me that right now, I don't even resent having the childhood I had. 
I don't complain, you know, and I don't even, and I definitely don't feel sorry for myself. I'll tell you the truth, I'm glad. I thank God I had the childhood I had because it has taught me a lot. And I think if I hadn't had it, having, having the way I thinking I had, I would have never really probably discovered God again. You know, but those questions that burn inside me, you know, they've made me what I am. You know, and, and honestly, at this stage in my life, I like myself again. <laughs> And, uh, and I found a lot of beauty through those questions. So no, I, I don't resent them, and I don't, and I'm not angry at my father anymore, to tell you the truth. You know, I still have pain, you know, and I still hurt sometimes, but I needed that, you know, and, and I thank God for it. And as far as my father goes, he was a complex man. He had his inner rage, but he stuck by his family, he didn't abandon them. He played a role in raising his kids. He wasn't perfect. He did believe in God very much. He had sort of just a personal belief in God. He didn't really, he wasn't close to any particular religious dogma or view, but he had a very deep belief in God, fear of God even. But um, no, I, I forgive my father. You know, I hope, you know, none of us are perfect. And uh, I believe that, you know, I believe that uh, he was all, you know, as, as hard as he was, as much pain as he caused, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not angry at my father. You know, I, I'm simply not. You know, and I certainly forgive him. You know. Yeah, I forgive him. I hope that I don't end up, you know, hurting people. It's taught me a lot. I hope I don't end up hurting people. You know, but I definitely forgive him. You know, and the damage doesn't have to be lasting. I have plenty of choices to make after that. You know, my father didn't make me into the type of person I was. You know, I had plenty of choices to make in my life. Yeah. Um, have you learned to read Quranic Arabic yet? I studied Arabic grammar for a couple of years. I could slowly but surely make my way through a passage. You know, I can't just pick it up and you know, recite it. A lot of people could do that even though they don't understand Arabic. But when I go through the Quran and research the Quran, I get out my uh, Arabic lexicons and dictionaries, and I, I uh, go through the words one at a time, and, and go back and study the grammar to make sure I'm not interpreting something in a wrong way. Because sometimes, if you could go back to the original language and analyze it for exactly as it said, you could uncover very deep and profound things that are easily missed in translation. And I found this happen again and again and again when I read the Quran. That the translator, even though he's very sincere and trying to do an excellent job, you know, just changes a word here or there, or changes the tense because he feels it must mean this, even though it says this. And when I go back and study it in its original, what it originally and literally says, I discover things that you would never find from a translation. So, you know, and I hope someday that I become even, I hope that I get stronger and stronger in uh, my knowledge of Arabic and grammar and my research abilities, but I'm not fluent in it. I only have sort of a, a literary skill where I could read it and analyze it very slowly and very methodically. You know, sometimes it takes me a day or two to analyze a single verse. Yeah. And sometimes weeks. Yeah. This question, I'm, I'm not sure what it means, but it says, you are a Muslim now, I suppose. Do you follow all the Islam's instructions and rules in your daily life? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yes, I, I suppose I'm a Muslim. <laughs> Do I follow all of them? I don't know. I'll, you know, I'm not holding myself up as a perfect person. You know, I don't know if any of us follow all of them, you know, what we're supposed to follow. But uh, in terms of the, you know, I think you might be referring to the rituals and the major uh, practices and uh, uh, things that we're, we Muslims are supposed to live by. I do the very best I can, you know, and I, and I do my very best. And when I fall short, if I fall short, knowingly un or unknowingly, I hope God will continue to help me and guide me and have mercy on me.
Uh, could you maybe just one quick thing? We, a lot of people here may, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we'll see again, uh, maybe just one uh, discussion of what Islam and Muslim, what those two terms mean. It's because oh. I think a lot of times people categorize religion as this religion, that religion. If they could at least know what those two terms mean, it might help also to Islam? understand. Yeah. Islam means uh, self-surrender, surrender, capitulation. You know, when I became a Muslim, I felt I surrendered. You know, I surrendered to an irresistible truth. I surrendered to myself, to a God that I had resisted all my life. You know, I surrendered to a truth that I maybe fought against and denied. You know, so it means sort of like a peaceful surrender, surrender to peace, an acquiescence to mercy and to truth and to God. You know, so, you know, self-surrender is the, what Islam literally means. A Muslim is from the same root, you know, the same Arabic root that surrender comes from. A Muslim is one who surrenders themselves to God. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't read the first part, but I, I think the second part of this is a, a lot more interesting. Uh, and one thing you've already answered also. Say one has accepted the oneness of God through uh, reasoning. Does the Quran tell the person to also reason with the commandments in the Quran, such as prayer, etc., or simply obey it? Oh. Uh, boy, I mean, how do you reason commandments? Uh, I don't... You know, the... Hmm, I'm trying to think. Does the Quran... The Quran tells you always to use your reason. I mean, definitely. You know, but... Let's see, does it tell you to reason about the commandments? I, I know it tells you to reason about faith, you know, and belief, and about God and your relationship to God. You know, but the Quran, I think, doesn't present its commandments as debatable points. Are you following me? So I would, take, I would say, you know, it pre presents them as commandments. I don't think commandments are, by definition, something that you're supposed to debate or, you know, reason. Not that, you know, you don't use your reason when you approach them. So, for example, there's a verse that tells you that when you prepare for war, multiply your horses among, you know, gather up your horses to drive fear in the hearts of enemies known and unknown. You know, to act, in other words, to act as a military deterrent. Because in those days, cavalry was something that, should, you know, drove fear into the hearts of your enemies and would prevent them from attacking you if they thought you had a powerful cavalry. Well, today, I mean, a Muslim leader taking his army into battle, I wouldn't think he would say, do we have the horses? You know, gather up the horses. What happened to the horses? We got the tanks, we got the submarines, we got, the, where are the horses? For, you know, <laughs> did anybody get the horses? You know? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I mean, so in that sense, you do use a certain amount of reason. You know, you understand that these were revealed in a certain context, but they might be able to be generalized to another context. You know, when the second caliph, uh, the second successor of uh, the success, you know, after Abu Bakr, the first leader of the community, after the prophet, after him came a, a caliph uh, by the name of Omar. And there was a time of severe famine and the tremendous strain on people and widespread poverty and starvation. And during that period, the Quran has punishment, you know, stipulated punishment for theft. Well, during that period, Omar rescinded the punishment. Because he, you know, because in his, his thinking, he felt that it would be people were driven under under the abnormal strain and conditions that they were under in this se severe famine. They were driven to maybe because of the facing of starvation and their fears to do something acts that they would normally not do. So he lightened the sentence and punishment in such a case. So again, he used a certain amount of what you would call in Arabic ijtihad you know, personal reflection and thought and reason. You know, so when you tell me, when you ask me that question, I have to qualify it. You see what I mean? Yes, I mean, there are commands, but there are always issues of context, whether you're following the spirit of the revelation, whether you are, what you're doing is accomplishing the, what it, the purpose that it, you know, that it's pointing to. Are you following me? Um. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of paraphrase this. I think I know what they're getting at. Some um, of these questions just don't have yes and no answers, in other words. <laughs> uh, 
the message of being, uh, believing and doing good deeds um, is seen in the Quran uh, that this is just not enough, that, this, this that there must be an adherence to this oneness of God and, and that this won't be forgiven. It's the only thing that won't be forgiven is, is association, shirk. Yeah. So why is that such a big deal if really just believing and doing good deeds from what you have said earlier is yeah, really... Believing yeah, in, believing in one God and doing good deeds. You know, that's the formula throughout the Quran for success. For those who believe and do what is right, they will have an unfailing reward. You know, so that is much stressed. There is a verse, you know, there's a verse in the Quran that says, oh you, have, oh, you who have sinned against yourselves, never despair of the mercy of God, for God forgives all sins. But yet there's another verse that says almost the same thing, but it says the one sin that will not be forgiven is the stubborn and persistent denial, conscious denial of truth. The setting up of the insistence on worshiping, putting false gods, whether that, and the Quran gives examples, not just concrete examples, but lusts, power, money, the pursuit of material things, the stubborn and contumacious insistence on putting those type of things before the worship of God, the conscious denial of God and setting up other gods, other personal deities before that is the one thing that will utterly destroy a person, no matter what. You know. And it's obvious why. You know, because if we are going to come to know and relate and experience God's being and beauty and etc., then if we do that, We've utterly destroyed. We've taken the absolute antithetical lifestyle to what we're supposed to achieve. We've pursued the antithesis of that. You know, and the Quran says that that is unacceptable. Yeah. I think I'm going to force you a little bit more on this question because I sure. heard a good question last night on this issue. Uh, you mentioned all the things uh, that God is, the merciful, the forgiving, the kind, the just, etc. Um, and I heard somebody ask up after the lecture, well, couldn't you build up a little idol or a rock or something and put all those qualities on that idol and and uh, and grow still? Your something that helps you focus your devotion, right. etc. Yeah, I've heard that many and why times. And why would that be so bad? Or, or why is it seen as so bad in the Quran? Yeah, so the question is, what about idol worship? What's the big deal? What's the big deal about putting up a stone that helps you focus your attention? on the deity, you following me? You, you don't really believe that the stone is God, but it helps you focus your worship. So you worship the stone and, you know, sort of mentally, uh, you know, that it's not necessarily such a bad thing. Or, you know, okay, what if you say a man is sort of reveals God in a very special way and so is the Son of God, but not really God, but you know, the, you know, or something like that. I'm not referring just to Christian, uh, Christianity, I'm just saying in general, there have been, you know, many beliefs like that throughout many religions over the years. I don't want to get on the Christian's case or anybody's case in this audience. But why, from the standpoint of the Quran, is such terminology which is many people, which, you know, when people frame it, don't really take it all that literally. Why is that kind of association with God dangerous? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a good illustration of that is the Quran when it says, just talks about terminology people use, the importance of terminology. It says, the Jews say Ezra is the son of God. Now, everyone knows that when the, when the son, term Son of God is used in Jewish circles and in the Old Testament, it's definitely not to be taken literally. It means one who is loved by God. If you look in the Old Testament, the Jews are strict monotheists. The term appears quite often there, Son of God. This one is the Son of God, that one is the Son of God. Jews are the children of God, etc. <clears throat> and the verse says, the Jews say Ezra is the Son of God, the Christians say Jesus is the Son of God. And then it says, you know, don't say that. It imitates the statements of idol worshippers of old. What seems to be the point there? It's because, yes, certainly you might make a statement like that, and you may have it, understand it in a symbolic sense. You may understand it in a highly intellectual way that maybe doesn't even conflict with monotheism. 
But the problem is, is that when, you, when others start hearing you preach that statement, if others start adhering to that statement, others may not take it in the same way, may not at all understand it in the same way you do. It's easy to degenerate those sort of statements, those sort of dogmas, into becoming simple and unadulterated idol worship. Are you following me? It's very easy to corrupt such notions. I'll give you an example. Maybe I will like to pray to that sign, right, just so I could focus my attention on God, and every day I'll worship that, and to show my love for God, I will bring over here food and everything every day, you know, and put flowers around it, and make it the object and purpose of my worship, the attention of my worship. And then my children might start doing the same, you know. My children say, Daddy, this is what the religion about? Yes, this is what the religion about. We focus on this. And my children might do it in a very primitive way. Okay? And they may understand it in a much more primitive way. And then their children may start seeing them doing the same. But the problem is, is that the more you do that, suddenly it starts to seem ridiculous to people. There's a lot of people who are sincere in their desire to follow the truth who start doing that and seeing that and saying, that doesn't make any sense. And instead of that becoming something that could bring someone closer to God, instead it becomes a barrier between people and belief in God. Are you following me? So whenever you corrupt religion in that way, it could actually work against the benefit of humanity. So that people, through use of such terminology, for devotion to such idols, eventually the religion and the faith can become totally ineffectual. Especially as people advance and gain in knowledge. You know, among primitive people, you know, they might just accept it. But as they become more mature, and as they're exposed to greater learning, they look at that and they become totally adverse to it. What is this primitive stuff we're doing over here? This is an embarrassment. You know, bowing down to rocks and stones? What? It's only an object. This religion is crazy. Look in the West. How many people have left their religions, traditions behind? Because they say, this doesn't make sense. This is too much like the idol worshippers of old. No. I, can't, I can't buy into that dogma. The problem is, is when we develop our own means, you know, or we corrupt the truth, corrupt uh, monotheism, to even a slight degree, we, we construct a barrier to so many people Right? We actually erect barriers to belief in God. No. I don't know if I did a good job of that, but I'm running out of gas. For sure. There's one question here you already, you already answered, uh, and then somebody just asked had he done Hodge before, and he said last night that he had, he had been on Hodge. Uh, you said that people who do righteous deeds according to what they know will seek heavens, I think, will, I think it's just saying are seeking heaven, then does that make ignorance a sin from a Muslim's perspective? I'm not sure what, what they're asking. Is ignorance a sin from a Muslim's perspective? How about we keep it there? Yeah, and so, a couple of times the Quran says that you are, not, you, know, you are not punished for what you do in ignorance. You know what I mean? But it has to be true and sincere ignorance. Right. You know, there are people that are just not exposed to certain truths. And when they're not exposed to certain truths, they do not reject them consciously. You know, but it is the conscious, stubborn rejection of truth from which we suffer. You know, so you take someone like my mom, she wasn't really quite sure what, what the Trinity meant to her. She really didn't. You know, when I would ask her, what does it actually mean? She would just say, it's a mystery, Jeff. You know, it is a dogma of our church, but it's a mystery. I don't know exactly what it means. But I know there is a God, and there is one God, and I love that God. Are you following me? And yet, you know, she had this sort of mysterious assumption about the Trinity that she didn't really know what it represented. You know? But from a Muslim perspective, and I, I'm not trying to attack Christians here, from a Muslim perspective, you know, if what my mom knew, you know, believed, on, you know, because that's all she's ever been exposed to, and she never had pre been presented with an alternative, 
and she just died a very believing and devout woman who did very good deeds, from a Muslim perspective, she cannot be blamed for that. But if I came to her, you know, and started to, you know, discuss things with her, and I made it plain what I think, and God only knows what, you know, how good a job I'm doing, and how, what her capacity is to understand what I am saying, and etc. God only knows. But, you know, if at some point she sensed a truth in what I was saying, or even a superiority, you know, she sensed that what I was saying made more sense, seemed more real, seemed more accurate than what she believed, but she stubbornly clung to this because she was afraid that her husband would reject her, or that all her friends would mock her, or something like that. You know, she was, you know, feared the personal material and, and social price she would pay by even considering this, and only God knows whether, you know, she really would have done that or not. If that's it, then I would say that, you know, when a person does that, they're doing damage to themselves, definitely. You know, they're doing grave damage to themselves.